Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, staff. I would like to call the meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals and the media may also be audibly and or visually recording this meeting. As well, a reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda this morning? Yes, to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Added as item 3.1 are the minutes from the January 21st GIC budget meeting. Thank you, Madam Clerk. May I please have a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended? Councillor Danko, Mayor Eisenberger. Recorded vote, please. And that item is carried. Declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest this morning? Seeing none, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting, January 21st, 2020. May I please have a mover and a seconder to approve the minutes of the January 21st meeting as presented. Moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Marula. All those in favor, electronic vote. And that item is carried. We're now moving on to presentations. Item 6.1 on this morning's agenda is the Hamilton Farmer's Market. Eric Miller, treasurer, will provide the presentation for the Hamilton Farmer Market Board. Good morning, Mr. Miller, how are you? Good morning, very well, thank you. Good. Thank you, so I'm uh, Eric Miller, I'm the treasurer of the Hamilton Farmer's Market. Uh, board. Our, our board is composed of vendors in the market, uh, citizen representatives that have been chosen by uh, either you or your prior uh, colleagues, including myself and also Ellie Bowen, who is our secretary, who joined us in the gallery today, and also Councillor Pauls is on our board as well. Yes. Uh, so happy to present the uh, budget, uh, Budget 2020. Um, overall, it's a uh, frugal budget that aims to deliver uh, similar outcomes as compared to uh, past years. Uh, we are following council's guideline of a 0% increase in the levy, and so that's what we have in our uh, budget. The levy is the same as in the previous year of 112000 uh, Our expenses uh, will total 805000 which is uh, 16000 less than the prior year budget in order to stay within the revenue that we uh, expect within the coming year. Uh, the staffing remains the largest expense at 325000 uh, this is uh, quite tight, though, on a year-to-year -year basis because of prior year it was just uh, 323. So we've uh, slightly restructured some of the positions and the staffing model uh, within our, our enterprise to keep it uh, as tight as possible. Common utilities, 117,000 uh, to be spent on uh, water and sewer and those sort of utilities. That's uh, provided, obviously, from the city, and it's uh, through city facilities that, we, that they invoice us uh, for that. Uh, same thing with city's uh, maintenance uh, and so on. Uh, that uh, the maintenance fees uh, charged by the city to us are uh, up 3.9% uh, from budget 2019. So we've had to uh, cut in other areas to stay within balance for that. Uh, we provide uh, subsidized customer parking, and uh, on that basis, uh, we expect to spend about $55,000 on a net basis to reimburse uh, customer parking at the city's uh, York Parkade, which is across the street from the market. Uh, marketing, uh, we have budgeted uh, $55,000 to spend on advertising activities, which is the same as budgeted in the, uh, in the prior two years. Uh, we're trying some new things out this year in the realm of marketing and uh, customer experience initiatives and so on, which will hopefully be quite successful. Um, we're much more in the pilot mode at this uh, stage. Our own source revenue of 692000 is 16000 less than the prior year budget, and that's in large part because we are a bit challenged to lease out some parts of uh, the market space that are very rigid in nature, and so it's hard to make them adaptable to, to generate uh, um, revenue dollars as easily as we'd like them. A monthly stall rentals uh, is the largest source of revenue at uh, 512000 uh, as I said before, um, we're expecting a little bit less than in the prior year because of our challenge of leasing out some parts of the market that are very rigid. Um, sponsorship, we're very grateful that uh, we can budget another $125,000 from uh, Meridian Credit Union, which is uh, nicely um, gifted as a five-year uh, arrangement uh, sponsorship of, um, of the 
Hamilton Farmers Market. And uh, we will be putting in, we were budgeting a $3,000 contribution to the Market Reserve Fund, and that's to um, build up um, an amount in that um, a source of fund to help with uh, hydrometer recalibration, which is a large ticket item that will come up in a few years, and also as a cushion in case we need to um, offset some of the variability in some other uh, larger ticket items. This uh, visually, hopefully this is helpful, uh, visually this is a uh, presentation of, um, of revenue and expenses, uh, just showing you proportionally then what the larger versus the smaller uh, items are. Um, as you can see that uh, within a balance of a budget of just over $800,000, most of the revenues from monthly rentals, uh, thereafter the Meridian sponsorship is a number two source of revenue. Uh, after that, third place is the levy from Hamilton. The levy from Hamilton offsets the facility charges that are charged to us uh, from Hamilton and our largest single expense, of course, is staffing. We do multi-year uh, scenarios for planning purposes. Um, that we do that internally. We don't present it as part of our budget presentation, but just uh, reassuring you that we do that internally um, to forecast out for the next couple of years uh, what our budget situation could look like. And uh, on that basis, uh, reporting that uh, we can sustain a three-year uh, forecast with expenses and uh, revenue growing modestly, uh, provided two conditions. I guess one condition is that of course, as long as the Meridian sponsorship is renewed at the end of its uh, five-year term. Um, and so the last full year of Meridian sponsorship revenue will be 2021. Uh, 2022 will be a portion of that because the Meridian sponsorship revenue does not align with the fiscal year of the city, so therefore it was a part year in the first uh, year. So that's a very um, important thing that's on our, 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 our uh, horizon. Uh, second thing, too, is that um, as long as city de departments do not inflate costs more than the growth in the city levy, uh, otherwise and we, have to, um, we have to feel the, the, the pressure if, for example, the facility charges that are um, costed onto our budget, if those increase more than, let's say, you know, the city uh, guideline, then that's going to create um, um, pressures that is hard to sustain in the coming years as the percent growth compounds itself uh, over time. So uh, that's as brief as possible, I think, on the farmer's market budget. Uh, hopefully that's good uh, overview uh, information with our request. Uh, as always, meeting agendas, minutes, and uh, this budget presentation, also great details including spreadsheets and all the rest can be found on our public uh, shared drive, which is accessible through the market's website, hamiltonfarmersmarket.ca. Uh, so we look forward to serving you uh, fresh and friendly uh, products at the Hamilton Farmers Market. Look forward to seeing you there and keen for any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Miller. We do have some questions. Councillor Judy Partridge, please. Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I also wanted to recognize the president of your board, Wilf Arndt, is uh, in the audience here, and thank him very much for all his work and, and everyone on, on the board. Um, you know, it's not always easy serving on uh, these... Uh, Know, different boards that we have throughout the the city and especially whether they're daytime or nighttime but uh, the council certainly does uh, appreciate it uh, chair I just have one question the the um, 125,000 from Meridian mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, in the in the uh, presentation it says year each year but you mentioned five years so is that 125,000 committed over five years or each year for five years that's, e that's each year for five years. And actually the sponsorship is slightly more than that because there is a portion that goes directly to the city's um, revenue generation team. John Hertel, who's the head of that, is up in the gallery. So the, the total Meridian commitment, I believe, is 750,000 total. Over the five years. Yes, over the five years, exactly. So that translates to 125 annually on a full year basis for us. Okay, and thank you, Chair. Um, so, and I also want to recognize the good work uh, done by John Hertel and, and his staff. Um, certainly, revenue generation has been high on his mandate, and uh, we're very pleased to see him deliver on that each year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no further questions, I appreciate your time today, Mr. Miller. You can take your seat. I need a motion to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All those in favor? Yes. Carried. Thank you. We're now moving on to the Hamilton Library Board. 
We have Nick Van Velzen, current board chair, Laurie Ann Spence-Smith, previous board chair, and Paul Takala, chief librarian CEO. They'll provide the presentation for the Hamilton Library Board. Please come down. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Picala. Lorianne Spence Smith is the was a board chair for 2018, 2019, and she's going to begin the presentation. And then followed by that, we welcome Nick Van Velsen, who is the current board chair for 2020, and he will complete the presentation and then we'll open for questions. Thank you, sir. Ms. Spence Smith, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here representing the Hamilton Public Library Board, and it has been my honor to serve as chair and to present our budget presentation to Council for a third year. We have three objectives for our presentation today. One, to provide an overview of our budget. Two, to highlight some of the ways we are working to support individuals and communities. And three, finally, to thank Council for your ongoing support. Here is our budget history for the last decade. Meeting these targets has required a lot of work over many years and continual effort. Numbers highlighted in green indicate we have met or come in under Council direction. Red indicates when our budget exceeded direction. And black indicates years when no formal direction was provided. For 2020, we are proposing a maintenance budget that meets the 2% direction, but we are requesting an additional 0.5% budget enhancement that would bring the total 2020 budget request to 2.5% or a total increase of $773,850. HPL understands that council faces many budget pressures. Since the early 2000s, HPL's underlying operating assumption has been that we need to use innovation and technology to create the capacity to meet emerging needs and not just ask for more funding. This 20 year long journey of innovation has enhanced us, sorry, has enabled us to control our FTE count while at the same time offering more services to meet community needs. Here you see our growth in service hours per week with a moderate decline in our overall FTE count. HPL now has over 90% self-checkout rate for physical items. As we have reduced low value work, like scanning barcodes, we have been able to significantly grow our support for individuals needing access to technology we have also been able to support the literacy skills of children while they learn how to read, provide more opportunities for lifelong learners, and keep our seniors engaged due to a significant increase in the number of free programs that we offer. HPL strives to be a great employer. As this chart shows, there have been some modest reductions in staffing over the last decade to meet budget direction. We are proud of the fact that we have achieved these savings through a long-term commitment to using attrition to reduce staffing and not to lay off existing staff. The chart also shows the, the breakdown of our permanent full-time and part-time staff complement. Because of the need to provide long service hours, many libraries, like HPL, have tended to employ a relatively large complement of part-time employees. The library board has asked staff to report on this annually and to look for opportunities to create new full-time positions. Here is an overview of our 2020 budget submission. We are requesting a 2% incre increase to maintain existing services, plus a 0.5% budget enhancement for operating costs relating to a new neighborhood branch in Parkdale for a total net levy increase of $773,850. In 
2020, we are facing some pressures, as well as some modest positive drivers. We remind Council that HPL staff cost of living increases are mandated to match the city's, the city's because of pay equity. On Lock Street, we have a very successful small neighborhood branch. We would like to bring that model to Parkdale. We have a strong partnership with Indwell that will keep construction and operating costs down. This branch would have great street presence at a very busy bus stop. We know a library branch will help individuals and families in that high density neighborhood succeed. To make that possible, we require an annual operating budget of $289,000. We would like to phase this in. We are asking for a 0.5% budget enhancement in 2020 and 2021, or $145,000 and $144,000 respectively. We forecast maintenance operating budgets over the next few years to be 2%. However, we are asking Council to consider the Parkdale branch enhancement in 2020 and 2021. That is highlighted here in yellow. In addition, we are asking for modest enhancements in the years 2021 to 2023 to accelerate our closing of gaps in service hours. That request is indicated here in purple text. My colleague Nick will expand on this shortly. The request for service hour enhancements starts in 2021 at 1.5%. We know that this request will need to be weighted carefully by Council next year against other priorities. Should Council support both, the total impact is indicated at the bottom of the last two lines on this page. In 2020, the total budget request is shown, which is 2.5% or $773,850 increase. From 2021, the total proposed increases are shown along with the total percent increases. Our branches and bookmobiles are bringing people together and advancing learning in all parts of Hamilton. Thanks in part to the generous support of the Dowler family estate, our two bookmobiles continue to bring the library to people where they are. We want to thank Council and our city partners for helping us engage such a major facility transformation the red stars indicate major projects completed in the last two years. Yellow indicates projects currently underway. We want to let Council know that both our Valley Park and Greensville construction projects are proceeding, but we are looking to close a modest capital funding deficiency in those projects. We will likely be doing that as part of the 2021 capital budget process. We are very excited about these amazing projects that will bring beautiful new libraries to their communities. The map only shows one black star and we are working with the city on a feasibility study for Mount Hope. If you looked at this map back in 2011, you would have seen six black stars, buildings that were not up to accessibility and other standards. So thank you once again. I am now going to hand the podium over to the 2020 Library Board Chair, Nick Van Velsen, to talk about service hours and share a few stories about HPL's impact on people's lives. Good morning, Mr. Van Velsen. You have Good morning. The floor. Um, I would like to first start off with the enhancement request for service hours. For future years, we are asking Council to make modest investments to help us close the service hours gap. A closed library is an underutilized community asset. A senior can't drop in to read the paper, students can't use the space to study, people cannot access the computers or Wi-Fi. The board does not ask for an enhancement lightly. We have worked with staff over the past three years to add over 170 hours a week in service without asking for more money. We will continue to work with staff in 2020 to look for those opportunities. We plan to bring the rural extended access model to both Carlisle and Greensville and eventually Mount Hope. We know that children who lack literacy skills struggle in school. 
all over the city, we help families grow the next generation of readers by making reading and learning fun. One of our most popular program is the Summer Reading Club. 10,000 children and teens participate annually. In 2019, 83% found reading more fun by the end of summer, and 75% reported that they are more, now more confident readers. HPL uses books, creative writing, technology, music, and much more to keep our teens engaged in constructive, positive activities that builds their confidence, skills, and deepens their connection to the community. Supporting employment. In 2019, HPL was one of four libraries to receive funding from Google Canada for 50 IT support professional certificate scholarships. The coursework is online, and Google funds a coordinator to support the adult learners. Normally, successful completion of online courses is very low. This is a picture of our first cohort of graduates from earlier this month. 41 out of 50 successfully completed the course, that is 82%, and they are now eligible for entry-level entry level IT support jobs. We are currently enrolling the next 50 students in this innovative program. Supporting seniors. Staying socially engaged is critical to staying healthy. HPL is working with researchers at McMaster to evaluate and improve senior programs and services in public libraries. HPL is the lead library on the National Research Grant. We work in partnerships with many organizations to ensure the library is a place that is helping our seniors feel that belonging and encouraging them to adopt an attitude that they can still learn new things. We believe our seniors still have a lot to offer and that they deserve to have some fun. New technology. HBL has a long history of embracing technology. We continue to help people get the skills they need in our ever-changing world. We also ensure that a world of useful and reliable information is available for, to everyone for free. In 2019, we introduced online card registration, making it easier for people to get a library card and access our wealth of online resources. We are supporting our friends at the Six Nations Library by utilizing our system to support their online registration. History and archives. Preserving our past and, and making it accessible to all generations is a long-time commitment of our local history and archives department. In 2019, we began with the Internet Archive to increase the accessibility of our collections. In 2020, HPL will become a scanning site for the Internet Archive, making Hamilton's rich history more available. Working with educators, we are able to bring Hamilton's rich history to life. New partnerships. HBL has a deliberate partnership strategy with a long record of accomplishments. We get things done because we work well with others. We know that there is too much work that needs to be done for organizations to work in isolation. A special note for 2019, we want to thank the city for supporting our partnerships with the Civic Museums enabling library card holders to get free general admission access to city museums. It has been a great success, and you will be receiving a report from the cultural department soon. Not to give too much away, but over 12,500 people visited the museums using a library card in 2019, and museum revenue is up. Only by working together are we able to achieve the goals so well articulated in the Our Future Hamilton vision. HPL is prepared to play our part. Thank you. The Library Board wants to thank Council for your strong support. You have supported a renewal of HPL over the past decade that has led to many positive impacts for the individuals and communities we serve. We look forward to continuing to build on our past success as we help people prepare for a successful future. We thank Councillors Partridge and Pearson for serving on the Library Board, and I would like to introduce the Board Members present. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's Ali Bowen, uh, I think that's it, yes. We were supposed to have more, all right. And are there any questions? Well, thank you very much. Councilor Pearson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor and uh, Nick and Lorianne. Thank you so much. Excellent presentations and it's an honor and pleasure to sit on the library board. So you had some exciting news and I'm not sure who wants to ask this, but I know we've been working on um, Lightning Parkdale, which is a great um, investment going forward. I'm sure Councillor uh, Marula is very, very pleased to see this coming to fruition uh, in the neighbourhood. And where are we on, and I'm going to ask as we chatted at the board, um, maybe Mr. Tackle can answer, the status of Valley Park and the um, 
Greensville site. Do we have any information on those two? Yes, uh, my, under my understanding is uh, both projects are being tendered. Construction is about to start. Uh, I, we did make reference to a short, um, a, a modest budget deficit for both that we're going to have to come up with in the next couple of years. We've been in contact with, well, the board has um, set aside library reserve funds um, uh, in case there is no other sources of funding. And we're hoping to figure out a way to split that, but the money has been set aside. So both projects are proceeding. We're really excited. Greensville's been a long time coming. And Valley Park, there's been so much growth in Upper Stony Creek. And that, that project, we're really excited. And the extra investment of the Heritage Green Community Trust has been, um, you know, really enabled us to expand the scope of that project. So we're full steam ahead on both those projects. And um, we will be working with council and the councillors on, on the issue of how we're going to fund that gap. Thank you, councillor. Thank you, and I'll, I'd like you to come back to me later for just comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Councillor Judy Partridge, okay. questions, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, great job, and I must say, it, it has been an absolute thrill and, pr and pleasure to work on the library board. Because of some personal circumstances with my father, I haven't been able to attend as many meetings as, as I would like to. But my question, Chair, is around the, um, uh, what I think is a, a very, very exciting program for the rural area is the, uh, the rural access uh, system. Uh, if you could just unpack that a little bit for those who are here and maybe watching, just what's involved and, and the impact that it's had, uh, particularly on Freelton, a tremendous growth there, please. Uh, the rural access model is where um, library patrons with the library card uh, can check themselves into the library during hours which the library is normally closed. Um, there are systems in place which monitor the branch while that patron is in uh, the, the building by themselves. Uh, so security and safety precautions are all looked after. Uh, it is a way of extending service hours without uh, um, leaning on to our, our staff complement. And it has proven very successful that uh, people in rural areas have the ability to access their library at times that they normally wouldn't be able to, that it fits their schedule. And it's also a community builder in that we have placed a certain amount of trust in the community to look, take care of this asset while, while they're in there on their own. And, and by all accounts, it has proven very successful. Yes, thank you for that. And, um, uh, and, and if I can just add to that, Chair, the, uh, it is remotely monitored. So if there are any questions that do come up from the folks who are in the building at the time, um, it is remotely monitored. There are staff out of, uh, I believe, Hamilton. Can you just talk a bit about that, please? Paul? Sure, so there is a two-way video fold, and then we have um, very good security camera coverage. So what happens is our security here at Central are monitoring those, um, those cameras. The other thing we've had to, to make sure that this was very secure is um, when someone uses the washroom, a little light goes off, and then the security are able to see if there's someone prolonged use in the washroom that might be you know, in a medical emergency, they can get, you know, call for help. So we've had very few problems with this, and like it's been, it's been said, is it's really enabled us to expand our hours without increasing our operating costs. So in the case of Greensville, it went from 17 to 60 hours. And we look forward to rolling this out at Carlisle, Mount Hope, and Greensville. We have made a commitment, and the board made a commitment, that they wouldn't use this to cut staffing in our rural branches. And so, and it's also a model that we do not, um, we do not plan to implement in our urban and suburban areas. There's simply a lot more people that um, justify the cost of, of having staff there. What I would say is what we do, have done, and we've done this at both Red Hill and, and at Terryberry, is from th Monday to Thursday night, library closes at nine, the library stays open till midnight, um, Monday to Thursday for quiet study. And we have a security guard supervising and, and people can access the computers. And as long as they're there, quiet study, 
you know, and this, so this is way, it's, it's quite a low cost way for us to extend the use of the library. So we're looking at expanding that um, in the coming, coming year. You know, we have to be kind of strategic about how we make these investments. Uh, the other thing is we've, last year, we were, we're starting to open libraries earlier, opening them at 9 instead of 10 a.m. So it's, it's, it's really been part of our, our desire to make sure the library is open when people want to use it. And, yes, and thank you. I, I really, you know, I'm excited about that uh, that being rolled out into the into the rural area or any branch where it would be appropriate to do so. I believe in Freelton, the the actual um, library users, the numbers doubled, and um, you know, it also many of the libraries are closed on Fridays, which in in many cases can be a PA day, and so it allows parents and 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 children and students to be able to to access. Um, can you talk a little bit more about expanding hours and around the PA days at schools and trying to line up with what they're uh, what they're proposing? Paul, can you talk about that or whoever's appropriate? Sure. So uh, currently this year, when both school boards are um, on a PA day, the library is open. So that often happens on a Friday. So we've opened most of our branches on those double PA days. That's been helpful, but I think what one of the reasons why we're asking for council to consider future year enhancements, we know it's a difficult budget year this year, but we're asking starting in 2021, is we really want to start opening on those closed days and where we can. And part of the issue is if a student goes to a library and it's not open, that quite a, sort of creates a disincentive for them to come back. And I think what, what we're finding is that dedicated library users will adjust based on um, based on whatever hours we have. But you might have a marginal student who really needs as much support as possible. And if their family isn't taking to them to the library, finding a, the doors closed, in a sense, creates a disincentive for them to, to come back. And so I think it's those, some of those marginal students that maybe don't have a, you know, a culture of their family going to the library, we really need to help them succeed. And so it's also about having people having access to, you know, a senior being able to read the paper and just be around some people. And, and, and so, so we, we've, up until this point, really been working on doing this without adding to our staffing. So looking at how we can use technology, how we can change the way we... So we've done this, it's been a several year journey. And I think we're, we feel we're at the point where we're doing as much as we can with our own um, innovative processes and that we need to look for a modest investment to help us um, close those gaps. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, and thank you very much. And I'll just wrap up with one last comment uh, about Carlisle. And I, I'm not asking questions about Carlisle, which may seem odd, but it's been a, a project that has been 10 years in the making, and it is such a good news story. We've been working on it, uh, I thank staff and, um, and also our private partner in this. Um, uh, we can't announce anything until they announce it, but it is official. There will be a Carlisle Library and a new library coming. Easing, Councillor. I know, I know. I, I tend to do that the odd mm. time, but it is a good news story for anyone watching or listening from the Carlisle area or Flamborough in general. It is happening. And I do hope within the next two months at the latest that we'll be able to have more of a public display. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tom Jackson, please, you have the floor. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, welcome to um, um, the Hamilton Library Board and Chief Librarian and staff. Uh, I've always said they're a special group of people, both staff and especially those that serve on the board. And Lori and Nick, uh, you've carried on in the fine leadership of uh, past and uh, your current chairmanships. and. Well done, great presentation, and Chief Librarian Paul Takala as well. Um, and I'm very proud of the representation from Councillor Pearson and Councillor Partridge liaising uh, on behalf of Council at the uh, Library Board for the issues that are important to us. Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, through you, I'd like to go back to slide 12, uh, please, about the enhancement, future enhancements. And um, Paul, if you want to uh, please uh, possibly respond, you and I have had a Couple of chats. Forgive me, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, for being a little pro kill one moment for Sherwood. If I heard correctly, between yourself, Paul, and Nick, you talked about under current resources and existing hours that you were able to find, I forget what it was, was it 70, 170 hours 
additional time to open up some um, Fridays at uh, a number of branches, but I still believe the Sherwood branch on Fridays and Sundays is still closed. And if I recall in my time on the board of the 22 branches, I seem to recall, and forgive me for saying proudly, that uh, the Sherwood branch was usually in the upper echelon in terms of overall circulation. So I'd li uh, first of all, if you can confirm, Paul, um, what the facts that I have uh, shared and uh, what your current resources allowed you and maybe didn't allow you to do, specifically with Sherwood, and for me to support future um, budget requests, such as future enhancements on slide 12, I need to have some form of commitment, assurance that I can give the East Mound community that hopefully that uh, they'll be in line for additional hours as well. So you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Takalo, please. Thank you for the question. And so just to clarify, we have, it has been over 170 hours that we've added. What we've been doing is, is investing in them making sure that there's a geographic balance so that we're doing that we started with Red Hill and Barton. Then we did, um, we did uh, both um, Dundas and uh, Turner Park. So we've been making investments uh, around the city. And I believe Sherwood is fifth um, in terms of activity. So it would be a, it'd be a high priority. I know Sherwood is one of the libraries that we've started opening early, opening on, on nine o'clock. And so in the morning instead of 10. And so Sherwood would certainly be um, you know, a priority. What we're looking to do is making sure that we balance things so that we're not um, you know, giving extra service here and, and not extra service there. And that's why what the board did was ask for four reports over two years, and we keep making incremental steps. And so um, I would say, I'm sure with high confidence, those numbers, if we were to be able to get the, um, those increases in 21, 2022, 2023, not only would we not be closed at Sherwood on Friday, but we wouldn't be closed anywhere on Friday. And so, so that's what we're working towards. And I think one message that we try to make, which is that we're gonna still try to use innovation, looking at more study halls, doing these other things. We're not gonna wait for, um, the enhancement, but and we're going to keep working for it. But we're asking council to consider that. We know next. We, well, we don't know what kind of pressures you're going to be facing next year, but uh, we wanted to put that out there. And and um, and by the time we get to this point next year, when you're actually making a decision, we would be able to provide more information about the tangible um, results of what that would be exactly in in 2021. Thank you for raising my comfort level, Paul. And Mr. Deputy Mayor, for any of my colleagues that maybe, you know, uh, here's Tom, like with Ward 6, I'd like to think my record when I was formerly a proud member of the library board and on council, whether it was the two new projects in Ward 1 with Locke and Westdale recently, or across the suburban areas, the big central library downtown, Terry Berry, Turner Park, um, I'd like to think that my support, both as a board member and council member, has been across the entire citywide system to ensure that uh, residents and neighborhoods across the board have great access to the system and to their branches uh, where, where close by and in proximity. But I, I needed to, on behalf of my East Mount community, put in that plug. So Paul, <clears throat> thank you for the early mornings uh, additional hours at Sherwood and with hopeful commitment that um, all branches by this time next year, if all things go well, we'll see additional uh, Friday openings. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to Paul or Laurie or Nick, you know I'm always going to ask, how are our wonderful bookmobiles doing for those shut-ins and for those that simply cannot um, have mobility to get to the branches? Who would like to give us an update on the wonderful two, new, two bookmobiles we still have? Thank you, Councillor. Takala? Everybody's being so, a little no, shy no, on this one. No, okay. and, and the bookmobile still yeah. still continues to great activity. We had about 26,000 um, visits this year, and um, I think 83,000 items were checked out. One of the other things we've been doing more with the bookmobile is using it as an outreach vehicle. So it's at events like Telling Tales, it was Satin Claus Parade, other things like that. And one thing we know, and we know that um, I think the um, little kids in our community love the bookmobile almost as much as Councillor Jackson does. Uh, 
because they love the bookmobile. And uh, so it's, it, it's good. And I think one of the other things is, like during, while we're, we're moving Valley Park, we're using the bookmobile during the couple weeks that'll be closed to get the, um, you know, to, to provide service. And we've added a bookmobile stop that's very successful in Rockton when we consolidate that in Linden. And so, so it continues to be a key part of our service. Did all members of council hear that? Not just seniors, but the next generation. Well, I was going to refer to you as the them. oldest kid on council, but. Thank you. Thank you. Not the oldest, the longest serving <laughs> kid on council. I look around, there's a few that are a little older okay, than I am. Let's but see anyways. the birth certificates. Anyways, all thank you. And of course, always, always in the great memory of um, Ed and Connie Dowler, who without children and finished their lives at McCassa Lodge and left their entire estate to the bookmobile service in this community. Uh, Paul, lastly, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, page 29 and page 30. Uh, Federation of Ontario Public Libraries, the, I mean, these two graphics are incredibly positive. Circulation per active card, hold, card holder amongst the nine comparatives were number two. And in terms of electronic material expenditures per capita were number one. Would any one of the three of you want to elaborate and comment on these two graphics and what they mean to our library system and uh, the incredible, maybe it reinforces the investment that taxpayers and councils, past and current, have continued to put in our Hamilton Public Library system. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you. He's giving you the time to boast, so take it. <laughs> <laughs> they're too so, humble. <laughs> just the, um, so we're very, what this really indicates to us, it's a measure of um, so how active our card holders are. And, and it's also a measure, we, there's another measure around turnover. And so we have our collections are very much focused on making sure that we're buying things that people use. And it's been an operating assumption of ours since around 2002 that the best predictor of future use is immediate past use. And so when things like, say, travel books or different things start to not get used as much because people shift online, then we change those resources so we don't have a lot of kind of dead material on the, on the shelves. Now this next one, and I think we, it's really important, our, our, so two things, we're gonna continue to circulate physical materials 20 years from now, you're gonna be able to come in the library and there'll still be physical books. But people are moving to digital. And, and so what we wanna do is continue the physical, but also embrace in the digital where it makes sense. And so we have been making investment in these. And our goal has been to grow the digital at a rate that's faster than the decline of physical circulation. And we haven't quite got there until actually this year. We had such a strong, we actually, our physical was doing better we had a strong growth in, in digital as well. So we're up to 7.2 million items, which is a record for us. So, so you know, it's not that checking out materials is um, the most important things, but, you know, it's important to know that we're, we're creating services that people are using and embracing. Your time is from 10 minutes, Councillor, but half of that was from answers, so. <laughs> oh, thank you. I thought it was for everyone's consumption that this wonderful information. So thank you, uh, Chief Librarian uh, Takala, and thank you for maintaining a nice blend and mix of traditional, uh, physical um, supplies, along with the modern digital as well. To this day, I still run into people who like the feel of a good book to read. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, for your indulgence. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Arlene Vanderbeek, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So through you to Paul, or, or whoever wants to answer it. Uh, I would just, I'm just wondering if you could, so my questions have actually been asked. So I have to come up with a question. So I am wondering if you could clarify. You don't have to. <laughs> well, because I want to say something. So I, I, just say it. I need, I, well, I do have a question. So, so when, um, when the rural areas are, are so for instance, Freelton is, is um, using the new extended hours. I just want to clarify, there's still library staff there during regular operational hours, correct? Good. Thank you for the answer to my question. Now I can say something. I really want to thank Paul for uh, his, his great communication with me and the way that he has worked with me, not only on what's happening in Greensville, 
but uh, but what, what we did with the Dundas Library when it was being renovated. And his, his, um, his ability to stay in touch and keep me involved um, has been greatly appreciated. And so I really wanted to say that publicly. I also, as a past chair of the Dundas Public Library before amalgamation, I want to say that I sincerely appreciate on behalf of my community and, and the whole city, I'm sure, but I'm speaking about my community at the moment, the way that you have managed to adapt to the real world over the years. And, and the fact that, that it's showing on this, on the chart, or at least the chart before, about the fact that, that it's a very popular um, service to the city. And, and so I, I really want to congratulate you on that. And, and I mean, not just in one direction, but but also, not only technologically, but also operationally, and the work you do on the social side of it, because that's a big part of the library in my community, as I'm sure it is everywhere, where people can actually come together and socialize, not, not in the way, not, not a party, but they can come together and socialize in a learning environment. And so uh, I would like to just thank you for that on behalf of uh, Ward 13 and, um, and myself personally. So thank you to all of you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pearson, you indicated earlier that you had some I, comments to make. I did, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thank you for that as, as a board member as well. Um, I too want to commend Paul and all of the staff of the library, and some more have joined us. And just for committee's indulgence, recognizing that they were on for 10.15 this morning. So everyone was here on time. We started earlier. So just, just in fairness You have a good here. chair. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But I want the committee members actually, and Paul, if you can recognize there's, I think uh, John Kirkpatrick is here, Harjita's here, uh, have come in. I'm not sure if I missed anyone else as, um, as board members. John Kirkpatrick is a member of the board, and Harjit Dhaliwal, Harjit. And then we have several of our senior management team. Right, and I think it's, mm -hmm. go ahead. So I, I just wanted to say you, that, um, the, we have a great staff at, at the library board and it, it's a team effort. And so, uh, you know, we just have great staff. And I think we also have a very supportive library board and um, that relationship is very important to us. And so we wanna thank the board for that. Thank you, so I too concur and I, I wanna thank my colleagues because the uh, committee members, the citizen committee members that have been chosen this, this for this term have been excellent. And you know, past members have also been very, very passionate and moving the library forward. And I'm truly amazed every meeting, every report that I read of how much is done at the library that we don't even realize on a day-to-day -day basis. And I honestly un don't get understand how they can do it. The tremendous amount of services that are provided are phenomenal. The history and archive section, um, you know, um, uh, remembrance to Margaret Houghton who really did a lot in laying the groundwork and, uh, and creating this great section of the library. We've recently been able to acquire this CHCH records, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> that would have been destroyed and they have now been turned over to the library. And the library continues to work on other uh, media ve venues and, and things that can be brought into the library and saved so that citizens have the ability to go in or go online and access them and I think that's wonderful. You know, from with amalgamation, Hamilton Public Library took over 11 suburban libraries. And I can tell you, being a member of the Wentworth Board in Stony Creek days, there was a lot of work that they came into because the Wentworth Board was very, very frugal. We also didn't have to deal with AODA issues at the time. So as I say, they've done a tremendous amount of work. It is exciting too that Valley Park is on track and hopefully we will get the green light, excuse the one, for Greensville and uh, that'll be a go. And uh, you know, they will continue to work uh, in meeting the goals of, of targets for our budgets and doing the very best they can with the, um, the dollars that we have. And I really, really want to thank everyone, our chair, past chair, current chair, and all of the members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nan, if you can take the chair for a second, please. Chair Nan, through you. I just want to take the opportunity to thank the board, the staff, even our city staff on the Valley Park expansion. Uh, I want to also thank Councillor Conley who um, took up the yeoman's task in the last four years to make sure that it stayed on track. 
Um, I was very impressed when we had the groundbreaking. I had not seen so many people come to a groundbreaking before. Usually you have a few politicians. Um, they were packed and they had to stand back on the street practically, get the wide angle lens to get everyone in. It was thrilling to see staff there as well as senior management, volunteers, board members, uh, and Councillor Connolly, of course, was, was present. So, uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, uh, the Heritage Green Community Trust. Uh, their, their contribution was 1.25, 1.25 million, uh, which really allowed the scope of the project to be expanded. Uh, they were thrilled to be a part of that project. They still talk about it quite frequently. They're eager to see it done, um, and so am I, but we have to work through the process. But thank you very much for everything that you're doing for Upper Stony Creek. With that, I'll take the chair back. Thank you, Councillor Nan. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments from my colleagues, uh, you can take your seats, please. Thank you for attending today. A motion to receive, moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All those in favor of receiving the document, thank you. We are now moving on to the Hamilton Police Services Board. Chief Eric Gert will provide the presentation for the Hamilton Police Services Board. Chief Gert, if you could come down, please. Mayor Eisenberger. If I might, uh, just kind of preamble this with uh, a welcome to the Chief and to, uh, to uh, the Deputy Chief Frank Bergen and uh, our newly appointed uh, Deputy Chief Ryan Diodati and uh, Anna Felice and John. And uh, uh, soon to retire, uh, Lois Moran. We're going to miss uh, Lois, and we're looking for a new board, board administrator, and we thank her for uh, many, many, many years of service to our community. This will be her last budget, and I think, uh, you know, stand up and re-recognize Lois. I thank you. And thank you. I'll just uh, kind of preamble again that uh, this budget was approved by the board uh, un unanimously on uh, Monday. And previous to that was uh, vetted through the, uh, the board's budget steering committee, uh, chaired by, or chaired by uh, Councilor Collins, myself, and Don McVicker. And uh, obviously, our, our uh, local board members, our council board members, are Councilor Jackson and Councilor Collins, and myself. So, on that note, uh, Chief, thank you for your uh, hard work. And you know, it's been a challenging year or years in terms of police servicing, and the service continues to grow. The demand for services continues to grow, and I think your budget's reflected that. So, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Councillors, our senior team who is here, and senior staff from the city. <clears throat> just to kind of remind you, this is out of our strategic plan, which we just revisited for a three-year period. Uh, and these are the major core strategic directions. So community safety, which includes both traffic safety and public safety. And I do split the two because they're combined and in many ways have equal effects. Uh, engagement and partnerships, and you'll see some of this uh, more evident in the community safety and well-being plans. Uh, both in terms of what we've done to date, uh, what we anticipate in the future. Uh, people in performance, obviously we're a people-based business. This is about our own people, how we manage our performance, develop the knowledge, skills, and abilities. And just as a quick comment, because I do visit the parades uh, at the front line every year, uh, I continue to be impressed by the critical thinking of our frontline members, uh, their tenacity, but also their passion and investment, and it sounds hokey, but it's true, in helping people. That's why they've joined the job. Uh, so I continue to be impressed by uh, those who are replacing us. And technology and asset management, obviously technology, we just saw it with the, the, the uh, library board. Uh, we try to stay current as well, look for opportunities both for cost avoidance, but also things like, and it's on the horizon, it's not in the presentation, next generation 911, where members of the public will be able to actually send in digital uh, whether it's uh, email or whether it's uh, video evidence, all kinds of applications. And that's mainly by the CRTC for 2023. If we look at, um, so if we look at kind of our policing context, and it's changed through the years, adequate and effective service, and I'll list that in the PSA, but really the enhancements around quality of life and harm reduction. They're not necessarily, and I don't mean it in a derogatory way, part of the core things, but it's about taking a different approach that's not just enforcement based. Can we look at aspects, our seniors for example, where we can enhance quality of life? Harm reduction, both through uh, strategies at the opioid round table, uh, supervised consumption sites. What is our particular perspective relative to working with our partners to look at harm reduction, which we believe in wholeheartedly? And then of course, case law and new law. As you know, we're governed both by the Constitution, Police Services Act, 
Supreme Court decisions, and as they happen, we have to be able to respond to the directions of the oversight that that provides. So if we look at the Police Services Act, the current one, which is under Section 4.2, uh, the reason I've listed the anticipated, and they haven't been particularly creative, that's okay, COPS, Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, uh, we don't anticipate that the core duties will change. I have sat at those tables that are looking at the statutory and regulatory requirements. Uh, so you'll notice crime prevention appears first. Why is that? It's the old adage, a ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. We believe in that. Whether that's uh, streaming kids out of criminality through programs, different dispositions, uh, whether it's working with those with addictions to ensure that they don't appear before the courts, it may be a last uh, step measure, but are there other preventative approaches? And you'll see some of those throughout the uh, presentation. Law enforcement, obviously our core business, whether it's, and we know that the leading call for service is domestic violence. It's a blight upon society. We continue to work on that. We have had increased reporting, and we do know that in many cases it will be anywhere between eight and 15 instances before a victim survivor will in fact report it. So how we handle that uh, is extremely important. It is one of our leading calls for service in terms of time, both uh, family-related calls but also domestic violence. Public order maintenance, we've seen a growth not just here in Hamilton, but across Canada in terms of requirement for that. As you know, it's a balance between the constitutional right under Section 2 to free speech, but where it broaches into criminality, we have to be ready for that as well. So that has consumed a fair bit of our resources this year, uh, but it's been a growing industry for the last uh, number of years. And of course, emergency response. Within the policing context for quality of life, our aging population, and think about physical, emotional, and financial abuse. I just had an update uh, from our fraud uh, detective sergeant. He's up at the top there. He's now my executive officer. Um, so for example, the CRA scam, and I'm sure you've all received the phone calls, and you're like, really? And uh, it's declined to about a 5% uh, percentage of those scams that are available. So there's been a huge public education piece, so people aren't victimized, uh, and because they're nimble, uh, they replace it with uh, the bank examiner scam, where I just need your PIN number and your account number over the phone, and in some cases they'll spoof actual numbers, uh, so that when you phone back to those agencies, uh, you think you're actually speaking to the agency responsible. So again, we do that as an education piece. Um, we, it's an active field, and we do know what the growing uh, demographic, this continues to be an issue, and the perceived fear of crime. Increasing diversity in newcomers, we're fortunate enough as a city to have a diverse population, not as diverse, say, as Toronto or in Brampton, uh, but it is, and we uh, obviously welcome newcomers to the city. Uh, we are a country of immigrants, and uh, we support that. Uh, so to support that from the service, we obviously need both language, and cultural diversity to address that. So for example, I was just at the badge presentation last week, both for our recruits, our volunteers, our auxiliaries, our civilians. Uh, we have been deliberate about seeking out diversity and I view it as three faceted. I know there's other dimensions, but these are the key ones. Visible diversity, cultural diversity, and linguistic diversity. In many cases, the people who are coming to our service have three and four languages. That gives us better ability and of course, the public wants to see themselves and the officers that serve them. So this has been a direct focus and we continue on that journey. Some of the changes uh, for harm reduction. And when I talk about drug paired operation of motor vehicles, it's not just cannabis. We know through our drug recognition uh, experts who do that analysis, uh, they have to detect what in fact the drug is that's responsible for the impairment. That could be uh, methamphetamines, could be fentanyl, could be opioids, could be heroin, uh, could be, a, in fact, a combination of prescription and non-prescription medication and or alcohol mixed in as well. Uh, so we do know that there's been a rise, but also we've done a significant amount of training around field sobriety tests from our front line to detect that. We know that the carnage from that, we roughly have between 16 and 20 fatalities each year. If you look at our homicide rate, it's almost synonymous. When you think about the impact to the families and the survivors, whether you're killed through violent means by a weapon or a motor vehicle, the end result is the same. Traffic safety remains a huge priority and certainly for impaired operation. Uh, just ask Mad Canada. 
our opioid crisis, uh, we have been supportive of the supervised consumption sites. Part of the antagonism that re uh, rests in some communities, uh, it's a NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, but we believe through harm reduction and working in concert, particularly with Denise Brooks out of the urban core, uh, that we want to be present, but not intrusive. And by that I mean, you don't want to deter people from coming, but if you get assaultive offenses, and we've been called for those, drug trafficking, we've been called for those. We wanted to connect, and we continue to do that work, with those administering uh, the facility to ensure that we strike that balance. And obviously our goal is to decrease crime around the area, but obviously reduce the harm, and whether it's in the lax zone, or whether it's uh, enabling people to come to that supervised consumption site to reduce the risk uh, of overdoses or death. Our person in crisis unit, again for harm reduction, I believe we've got the platinum standard across Canada because it is multifaceted. We have the social navigator who addresses issues with, quite frankly, low risk people. Could be as simple as somebody not getting to an appointment. Why? They don't have a calendar, they don't have a phone, they really want to go, but they just don't know how to do that. So this is low end, but they are often very frequent users of emergency services, hospital, a whole range of resources. Our Coast Unit just celebrated its 20th year, and that's really around post-interventions with people with mental health issues that are not necessarily life-threatening, but can we work in concert with our social agencies to get them the help they need? And lastly, of course, our MCERT, Mobile Crisis Rapid Response Team. And I'll get back to that a little later. <clears throat> so as far as the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan is concerned, and I know that under Paul Johnson's direction, uh, they're moving forward, they had a meeting this week, uh, this is mandated in the Police Services Act, actually the new COPS legislation, but it's actually the municipality that's responsible for it. We do play a role, but not a huge one. And in terms of methodology, that makes sense to me. There's lots of other approaches to help people, whether it's mental health, youth crime. So just think about youth crime, the effect of literacy, and how important that is to stream people out of criminality and risk factors. Uh, uh, Youth facilities are involved, uh, school boards, public health. Uh, we will participate with them. And I think we're well positioned in this particular city because of the work, and again, this is Paul Johnson, who was the chair of Best Start many years ago, looking at from zero to four as an age group, how do we best help kids uh, to do exactly what the core mission of this council in the city is, uh, the best place to raise a child. Wraparound is a concept that's existed for well over 25 years. Um, this has gone on in Stony Creek, it's gone on in Hamilton. The concept is not new. And I mentioned our social navigator program. There's many. I think when we finally compile this list, I think for Hamilton, because we've been doing that work, we'll be well positioned to continue that. And of course, the metrics are laid out as well in terms of the act. We know for mental health, one in five are affected. We know that vulnerable persons are particularly affected and the concurrent factors that affect that. Homelessness, addictions, poverty, and of course mental health. So if we look at our uh, mental health and addictions, and particularly our mobile crisis rapid response team, when we began this, and of course we did the metrics under my predecessor, Glenda Kerr, we were apprehending people on the street at a rate of 75.4%. Life-threatening situations where the person is either going to cause harm to themselves or cause harm to others, so it's not just a matter of acting out in public, this is immediate harm. We apprehended and brought them to hospital for assessment at the rate of 75.4%. We now apprehend at the rate for a three-year average at 16.1%, almost a 60% reduction. So think about the clients affected. They're not sitting in an emergency room, often because of the circumstances with threatened violence with handcuffs, which is a safety issue for everybody. They're not stigmatized by it. They're not crowding up the emergency rooms. We continue to do that work. We continue to see both work avoidance in a good way, but also reductions to our partners in all those effects. So we continue with that work. Uh, slight introduction in October 2018 of amendments to the Cannabis Act, legalized now, as you know. And in this particular city, we were affected by illegal dispensaries. Uh, we, in fact, met with the Cannabis Secretariat and said, uh, we continue to do seizures, clear the place out, next day they open up with new uh, supplies. And, of course, you as counselors were affected by the community saying, I thought you were doing something about this. So, uh, we lobbied for a change in the legislation. 
And of course that happened, and then we were able to seize those properties pending a court disposition, pending a surety entered into. So we've gone from a high of 53 in October 28 to zero. Now is that a magic solution to the whole problem? No. We know that they've gone to mobile applications, kind of gone back to their old methods. Uh, we continue to do that work on enforcement for the illegal distribution of cannabis. And of course we seized an opportunity to get funding through the Pro Provincial Joint Forces Cannabis Team. We were able to reach critical mass with our partners to shut these places down and do it at a rapid basis. Probably Georgia Peach is the most prominent. One, because of the number of locations. Two, because of their prominence, particularly on Upper James, with two locations. Those have remained closed and out of business. We have seized 23 properties in total, uh, returned, I believe it's all but six right now. We don't really want to hang on to them. We just want to make sure they're regulated. And we were the first in Ontario to actually do that. Uh, so our uh, legal counsel assisted us through new legislation and the courts, and we're able to effectively utilize that. This is just a picture, and I would definitely not take uh, total credit for any of this. Uh, these are the economic indicators. If we think about action deployment downtown, which continues, if we think about perceptions of safety, the regrowth of James Street, King William, Concession Street, it goes on and on. People feel safer coming down to the core. We're seeing cranes go up. We know that for investors, that's a big piece. We know that from a quality of life perspective, our public wants to feel safe when they come down here to the core. You see the building permits and the unemployment rate. With regard to crime statistics, and this is a 10-year span, to give you the broader picture, uh, I've only got to 2018. That's because uh, Statistics Canada doesn't actually publish this until later next year, uh, because of the comparators and the number of formulas involved. Uh, it's about the best I can do for you in terms of recency. However, I do have some stats from 2019 in terms of certain crimes. So you'll see the orange of the total is a total crime rate, total violent crime rate, the light blue, property crimes, and then other criminal code offenses. So looked at a different way from a one-year basis, we're looking at, this is the important one for me, total violent crime rate is down 4%. I do know that we've seen a 27% reduction in uh, financial robberies. So I expect, uh, given the weighting, uh, that these will continue down in the future. Total crime rate up 0.4, property crime 4, and then other crimes are down 11. If you look at the weighted average now, because crime severity index and the simple, and don't quote me on this, simple formula I use is if you've got a shoplifting, it might weigh in at two. If you've got an aggravated assault where someone was wounded or maimed, it might be a 56 or a 60 in terms of how they tabulate the numbers. So our violent crime severity index, you can see, is down. And as I stated, um, our violent crimes have further been reduced, particularly robberies drove this category, but common assaults as well. Total crime severity index, and then the nonviolent. Again, expressed, and that's just to highlight that, again, 10-year span. From a one-year span, total crime severity index down 3.4, violent is down 13.8, and nonviolent 1.5. So if you look at our comparators, and this is a national survey, um, God bless Winnipeg, um, here's the median, and as you can see, it goes, the black bar is 2018, dark blue is 2017, 2016 for the light blue. So it's creeping up for most jurisdictions. For the Hamilton experience, we did see a blip in 2017, but we're now just slightly below the national average. We are a busy industrial city still. Uh, this is a labor town, in my view, and uh, it's a working town. So we will see things like this. Some of our budget pressures coming into 2020, and again, we thank Council for the new investigative services building, uh, slated to open, we hope, around May. We're only about three months behind schedule. And there's, I won't get into the geo-helical supports issue. Um, they're all engineering issues. Uh, but again, we believe that coming in a cost-effective manner, and we will move from a 1970s-based lab, which most of you came in to see, thank you for doing that, to really state-of-the-art with four labs that look after, and they generally dedicated the victim, the accused, the scene, and they have an extra lab. And there's certainly high HVAC requirements but it's a total investigative services building, not just the forensics. And in particular, we were live to the issue of victims, survivors coming in. What's, how do they enter the building? Is it discreet? 
currently at Central Station, it's not the best environment. You have to go through the main public area then to a very large area for those who came up to the second floor. This is a much better design for their benefit. And of course, employee-related costs. And a decrease in revenues, no surprise about anybody here at Council. If we look at our staffing, and this is the victims of crime section, sexual assault, and you'll remember uh, the report from the sexual assault community review team that was completed, uh, and then we embrace those recommendations and are moving forward with that. They suggested we have increased staffing. You can see the effect we've got on the caseload. It's down to 668, but it's still quite high. And you can see that it's been an 84% increase since 2008. Some of the argument could be, oh my God, it's a, a sudden surge in the number of offenses. I would argue much like child abuse. This is about people willing to come forward, awareness, and how do we handle those cases. So again, if you talk about a case, if you recall Link's case, where he had the trafficking of a young girl at seven by family members, that's one case. So this isn't just, uh, you know, they're not simple cases in each, uh, each time we investigate. Uh, we took it to the board. The board has recommended, as you see in the bottom left column, that we defer our detective constable to 2021 for consideration. And we did have recommendation from the committee to say, uh, we believe it's more important at this point to have somebody in victim services as a support person from the outset before we're dealing with disclosures to provide that victim survivor with support independent of what decision they may make on the prosecution. As you know, if you follow that, uh, many times, uh, even if you get a finding of guilt, it is not resolution for the person. There is so much more to be done in terms of re-empowering them, providing them support, looking at counseling, working with other agencies. That's why we've gone with this particular choice. Uh, as a result of the new provincial administration's courthouse, and it was originally contemplated we have four last year, uh, my direction was we'll go with two, see what the impact is, want to see how the building actually works, what the real requirements are, and then we can consider an additional two for this year. So we have, in fact, done that pilot, have looked at the workload. Uh, it is still required, so we'll be recommending, but well, we have recommended the board, two additional constables. The cadet program, which was reenacted, uh, but under a different uh, premise. It's really looking at those members who might be uh, just over the age of 20 to say 27 or even up to 30, uh, people who may have English as a second language, may have to uh, acquire some more skills before they actually are successful at the frontline constable stage. And we've seen great uptake from this. We believe it's a tremendous mechanism to get people into our organization, acquainted with it. The skills they acquire are directly applicable when they come out. Our commanders have really embraced, embraced it and they're asking for more cadets. That's good because you want the participation and proper uh, rotation through our various areas to get to know the organization. This was, in fact, a competent increase through the collective agreement. Uh, we're now capable of hiring uh, 24. Did I get it right this time, Anna? 24 from 18, which was originally uh, the proposal. Uh, but we see it as, and we're seeing sometimes after a year or two, direct entry and great success coming on board. This is, and you know that recruiting is an issue for all of our organizations. This is a great mechanism to do so. The traffic safety enforcement, as you know, is one of the top priorities or policing in Hamilton, that's out of the community survey that we did for our business plan. And of course, you got the top three concerns there. Distracted driving, aggressive driving, speeding. I know that you've looked at the automatic um, uh, equipment that would be able to surveil that, whether it's speeding enforcement through photo radar or red light. Uh, if you looked at distracted driving, quite frankly, you can't pick that up electronically based on driving behavior. It could be either too slow, too fast, uh, I think probably the greatest one we see is somebody got their head down in their lap, looking at their phone while they're driving, sometimes in the link, sometimes elsewhere. And we know that from the studies, it's as uh, dangerous as impaired operation in some cases with the level of distraction. Aggressive driving, again, this can be anything from running stop signs to cutting people off, where you may not, in fact, have speeding, you just have very aggressive driving. Speeding, of course, uh, as you know, I'm a big supporter of photo radar. And of course, this aligns with our Vision Zero plan through Edward Saldo out of the uh, traffic department. We've been working for years with them. And it is a combination of education, enforcement, and engineering. So as I said before, relative to the deaths that occur in this jurisdiction, it's a huge concern. 
Just to give you the kind of the results of the Red Hill and Lincoln Alexander Parkway target enforcement, which ran for 40 weeks, um, we have seen a 45% reduction of overall accidents. That includes both, there have been zero fatals, personal injury accidents. The bulk of it is collisions where it's uh, just damage to the vehicles themselves. Um, we also supported councils supporting those special duties. Reason I draw the distinction is these were two six hour shifts where the officers strictly enforced predominantly speeding tickets on the link. They would do other things too, but they're dedicated to that. And of course, it flowed into the link in Alexander as well. Obviously, the two are joined. And you've got the tickets, the cost of the project, and of course, the projected fines. As mentioned, it's a combination of all three. We're looking at, uh, in this particular budget, approved by the board, eight dedicated traffic safety officers. So our counterparts for estimating costs here was around our divisional safety officers. For those of you acquainted through your beat crime managers, they do more than just speeding enforcement. They do impaired driving, they do ride lanes, they investigate personal injury accidents. So if we look at the time spent actually doing that core enforcement, that's why we've come in with a fairly conservative estimate. Uh, so we're looking at roughly the number of tickets that would be generated in a year and the estimate of fines per officer. If we look at our benchmarks, and I know that my predecessor introduced this many years back, uh, I believe uh, our former chair, Ferguson's cop to pop ratio, uh, you can see what it is. We are 11% below the national median, which has been coming down, by the way. Median's at 161. Keep in mind, this is per 100,000. So the delta between 144 and 61, you would have to multiply by five to look at, to bring it up to the median, which I believe is around 90 officers. We're obviously not coming in at that. <clears throat> Cost of police service per capita, always an issue. There is the median, and again, this is a national survey. There's Hamilton, and again, a busy jurisdiction. We have seen our available time doing calls for service. Uh, probably about 15 years ago when we did the Neighborhood Safety Project study, some divisions were running 17% available time. We're down to about 6 or 7% in some cases. So that could be 10 minutes at 3 a.m., 10 minutes at 4 in the afternoon, start of the business day. It's not a lot. And I see that Councillor Whitehead is not here, but I will cite him, invoke his spirit. Uh, as a serving member on the board for many years, uh, his phrase was, we are services punching above our weight class. He has said that a number of times publicly. If we look at the budget pressures broken down, we've got 2.14% for the collective agreement increases. Of course, that's under current arbitration system, which continues to be reviewed by all police boards. Our employee-related costs for new FTEs, the ISD building coming online, other operating, our revenue grant decreases, largely through, it used to be the Police Effective Modernization Grant. We have seen some increases, for example, in our prison transport and court security. The reason is they base those assessments yearly on what the actual requirements are. So again, John, $108,000 increase that arrived last Friday. So we've in fact, in fact taken that grant and applied it to a reduction at the board's direction. Our capital, of course, and a total budget at 4.02. So you can see the operating capital split and the combination thereof. Total budget increase, if we take out assessment growth in many jurisdictions they do, we don't hear, it would actually arrive at 3.02. Uh, this question gets asked quite often, what's the percentage of the police budget relative to the total levy? This goes back to 2004. I draw your attention to the row at the bottom. Police is a percentage of the city levy. Pretty much rotates between about 18 and a half to about 19.3 over the course of time. We remain pretty consistent as a percentage of the total levy. We're at 4.02. I understand you have this other slide in your package, which I was going to reveal at the request, so I will go to this one. This is a comparative between services, and if you notice the uh, heavy border for the last two columns on the right, board approved, council approved. Largely there are comparators. 
And they've got board approved at 4.82%, council approved at 5.14. No, we're not asking for an increase from the board. In fact, I think the dialogue would go elsewhere. Uh, as you know, when we met with the subcommittee, we had come in higher. There were reductions. There were reductions as of Monday. And we have tried to realize any uh, reductions we could um, and trying to be responsible. And I do appreciate the work of the budget subcommittee towards that end. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'm going to ask the Council's indulgence. I have a meeting at 11.30 with the Niagara Escarpment Commission, so normally I put myself at the end of the list. Can I ask the questions now with the indulgence of the committee? Thank you. So. Uh, Councillor Nan, if you can uh, take the chair, please, I'd appreciate it. So on page 25, uh, Chair Nan, it talks about uh, the grant decreases. So I'm trying to understand this because our budget, where our budget is and where the provincial budget is, they don't match up time-wise. So what transpires then if the province then comes through with a new program or a new grant in their budget, but we've already approved this and given you $1 million to offset a decrease in grants. Yeah, they usually run in March or April, uh, as you know, year end, having been a former cabinet minister. Um, we've asked them, and I was at a meeting once with the Sol Gen to say, can you correct that? And they said, uh, well, we're the province, perhaps you can amend yours. So I get it. Um, so for example, and we didn't know about the increase in the uh, prisoner transport to last Friday, you can see what we've done. Last year, that particular grant was increased by $700,000, I believe in March after the budget was approved. We, in fact, the board took it and applied it for reduction in the total overall budget. I think that might answer your question, should we get any additional grants? We continue to look for grants. And if you look at my uh, comments about the cannabis legislation, we, in fact, had four officers seconded to that project that were fully paid uh, because we knew in this jurisdiction we had an issue. Two, we needed the critical mass of all those officers to go and do the work. And right now, actually, some of our members are in other jurisdictions where illegal dispensaries are popping up. So we will take advantage of those grants, particularly on comments or otherwise, if it makes sense that we have impact here in Hamilton. If it's just lending out a body to uh, provide initiatives for the GTA, on its own, I wouldn't say yes. There are times where it makes sense, and we'll continue to explore that. Thank you. And so, uh, Chair Dan, uh, with regards to uh, speeding, uh, Council, as you know, has approved uh, two photo radar cameras. We have uh, 15 times two, so 30 um, school safety zones across the city that those two cameras will be rotated through, expectations being that that will start to reduce the speeding through those communities and possibly across the area. At the same time, you're adding eight new traffic dedicated officers. Was there any thought to seeing what the outcome is of the photo radar before we add eight traffic officers that we then can't eliminate? Well, I can tell you that's, as I mentioned earlier, that's one aspect. Uh, we did a study when I was a superintendent down east of the number of stop sign intersections. It numbered in the thousands. When you look at, as counselors, your number of complaints, it's not just speeding. It is stoplights, it is uh, controlled intersections with stop signs. Uh, it is, as I've said, distracted driving. None of the electronic means addresses those issues. Less, of course, um, and most of the signali signalized intersections are for red light cameras. But I also know that the number of uh, rear end collisions also increases. The number of T-bone collisions decrease. So it's a more comprehensive strategy. And again, we just went through the business cycle. We've done the survey of the public, this is the leading issue. When I go to town halls, and I've appeared with uh, Councillor Partridge, for example, the leading issue when we had all three emergency services, fire, EMS, and us, everything was about traffic. I think we had very few questions in relation to the other, even though you'd posited, they're all available to answer the questions. When I'm on CHML, probably about 90% of my questions rotate around e-scooters, um, all the other dimensions of traffic. Uh, Councillor Danko was asked to look at the three meter distance for bike lanes and we continue to do that work. Can't do that electronically. So there's lots of dimensions to this and that can even include, and we're looking for electronic solutions to the bus stop violations. There's so many dimensions and that doesn't even incorporate equipment issues. 
So for example, in Flamborough and Binbrook, you have heavy trucks over the half weight load, and only because I was a traffic officer. Uh, in those months where it's designated, again, that can't be controlled. We have the issue in Flamborough right now with the number of dump trucks. These are all issues that require expertise in the Highway Traffic Act and also uh, combined enforcement. I can tell you again, when you look at the turn effect, which you've alluded to, uh, riding on a motorcycle in the breeks, which is what you wear for horses, um, people know you're there to do traffic enforcement. It has the deterrent effect. We just had an officer out of our traffic unit do a little spot on police watch, and one of his comments was, and this was around Macklin and Maine, is the deterrent effect uh, by doing that enforcement. Uh, sorry, King, King and Macklin. The deter yes, because they don't intercept. Uh, well, they do eventually, but uh, any event. It's a deterrent effect, it's a presence, it has a calming effect. I agree with you with the electronic means and having traveled down to New Brunswick where they do have photo radar, you see the changes in behavior. That's for speeding. All the other fences remain. Thank you. Um, two more questions. How do we explain to the broader community that we asked all of the divisions to come in at 2% and you came in at 4.2? I think you've got your answer here. It's a combination of pressures. It's not a single thing. You've got collective agreement. Uh, our new FTEs represent only 0.61 of that increase. Uh, we do have a requirement from a forensics basis to upgrade that ISD building and other operating. I should note that even with our increase of the ISD building, our per square footage as a police facility just matches the median requirement. So it's not excessive. Uh, our revenue grant decreases. You face the same pressures we do but we have been diligent to seek out new grants and have done so to replace that, and of course, our capital. So, Chair Nan, how do we explain that to other departments and divisions who are facing the exact same pressures? They're all facing the same challenges. They're all facing the same fiscal challenges. They're all facing the same increases in salaries as a result of collective agreements. They're all facing increasing demands and expectations from the broader community. But we as a council have said we have to live within our means of the taxpayers. 2% increase and you come in, the police service board, you come in with a 4.2% increase. How do I explain that to the residents in my community that in the divisions where they actually need more money that we, we say no to, but because you're the police department, we just look the other way and say okay to four? Well, I think if I just came in with a straight ask without any rationale or uh, a strategic there, With respect. Can't, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to let me answer the question? Well, my question was, how do you explain it when they come in with the exact same rationale mm -hmm. and we say no to them, but you're asking us to say yes to you? I understand that. And again, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, I provided a presentation. This is not my decision. This is the board's decision. I present this on behalf of the board. I would ask uh, your counterparts, who've either approved it, and it was unanimous, uh, to answer that question. I believe I have in the presentation. Uh, I think, quite frankly, that's a difficult one. And when we look at public safety, when we look at the requirements for that, uh, that is really my responsibility to report that to the board. And what I believe are, is a reasonable request, given the circumstances. What I can tell you is looking at this other slide, with their counterparts who've deferred it for many years. They're now looking at increases of 40, in some case 50 frontline officers. Toronto's a good example. They put a moratorium for three years, and now we're seeing very large increases. Niagara just had a very large increase. So I've tried to provide the comparators. In terms of the answering to the public, again, we've included the median, the levy over time as a percentage, where we stand as a cost per capita, what our officers are per 100,000. So I think those are all answers to the broader context for the community. I understand your question. Uh, I believe that's up to this council to decide. Thank you, and my last question, uh, Chair Nan. And I listened, Chair Nan, very intently, as I do with all the presentations, but on this one I listened very carefully. And it was a very comprehensive presentation, but nowhere in the presentation the chief address the 47 plus shootings that we've experienced in the city of Hamilton. The cut to the guns and, and gangs task force, the shootings uh, continue to happen. 
We continue to hear that they're targeted. My frustration in my community is even though they're targeted, Chair and Ann, these are not marksmen. They don't know what they're doing with a gun. And when they're shooting at a house, the child could be inside and we don't know if that bullet's gonna go through or not. So the fact that it's targeted gives me no solace, no comfort. They're shooting in the, across the city at an unparalleled rate. It wasn't mentioned in your budget at all and you eliminated the task force. And I don't know how, what, how we're trying to bring down that, that issue, because all I keep hearing in the, every single media is that, well, it was a targeted event, so there's no risk to safety. Every time there's a shooting, there's risk to public safety. Because you know that stray bullets can cause just as much harm as a targeted bullet. So I'm incredibly frustrated that it seems at least from my perspective, it wasn't in your budget as a, as a priority for some reason. And I don't understand how we're trying to target it. We only get to see you once a year. Mm -hmm. I'm, I have stated this before around this table. I continue to be frustrated that the numbers continue to climb. And I don't know how the, the, the police department is trying to actually manage that issue and bring it down especially when I, I, we've all heard that the, the task force was eliminated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and through you, Councillor Nan. Uh, we have, in fact, responded to that. To mirror your comments, I have stated that publicly, uh, that there is uh, potential harm with a stray bullet. I've actually used the term. I don't know <laughs> if you borrowed it. These people are not marksmen. I've said that publicly a number of times. I certainly share your concern from public safety. In terms of an approach to it, and I suspect we'll see announcement early, or early this week, maybe actually be later this week, maybe early next week, uh, we have in fact met with the counterparts across the GTA to look at the approach. This is not just a Hamilton-centric problem. You have the 400 series highways, you have gang issues in Toronto, uh, the spread of crime, whether it's organized crime, traditional or otherwise, spreads across the GTA. We are in fact and have met with our partners and are requesting funding to look at doing exactly that, because you can't just do it in isolation. The other part, and I can say this week, we've uh, seized actually six guns, uh, kilograms of uh, various drugs, cash. Uh, we know all three are related. We know that that's where we have targeted. In terms of the gang task force, that was a temporary measure. And yes, you could sustain it. I could have come to this, uh, the board first, and then to council to say I need 15 more investigators in guns and gangs. We have a number of officers who are dedicated to doing exactly that. If you look at the proportion relative to other communities right now, we're certainly not an anomaly, to your point, and it is a much broader issue. We continue to work with both the Intelligence Service of Ontario, with our counterparts through the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit. So to say that we, a localized task force will do it alone is not accurate, not that you said that. But we continue to work with our partners, we continue to explore funding options, either from the feds or the province, and continue that work. Uh, Deputy Bergen, did you have anything additional to the shootings? We certainly came prepared to answer that. Thank you, Chief, and through uh, the Chair, Nan, and to speak to Councillor Clark. Uh, you aren't wrong to suggest the trends are, are troubling. We, uh, if we were to look back to 2012, uh, where we had 12, um, and, and then we start actually looking at the impact since 2016. 23 shootings in 2016, in 2017, 41, uh, 2018, 25, and in 2019, 47. In 2017, there were four homicides. In 2018, there were six homicides. And in 2019, there were eight homicides. And to your point, of the 47 shootings in 2019, eight were homicides, 25 were no victims, and 17 had victims, but varying degrees. In, seven, in those 17 victims, three of them were self-inflicted by misadventure and shooting their own hand or leg, et cetera. So the proliferation of those activities within the GTA, we are closely monitoring. The Chief talked about the sustainability of the Keep Safe project. We are fully aware of that. Uh, we are working with all our partners, and we are confident that, again, we have the ability at this point to continue uh, managing this file. I guess, Chair Nan, my frustration is that the budget of the police services seems to be based on democracy. The public is saying there's more speeding, and yet 47 shootings have occurred, 
and lives are at risk when it's happening. And, and I, I just, I, I find it incomprehensible that earlier this year, we would have eliminated that program and the shootings continue to increase. And then you come before this council with your budget and you don't even address it. You didn't even mention it. It was almost inconsequential. And I know it's not, but it's a major issue in our community. I don't disagree. Lives are getting ruined. Um, people are getting hurt. People are getting killed. And innocent victims. We had Mr. Johnson just went out to his car in the morning and got gunned down, mistaken identity. I, somehow we have to get a handle on the proliferation of guns in the community and the gun crime. It just frustrates me immensely that we had a task force and for whatever reason it was eliminated and the problem continues and you come before this board or this council and you don't even mention the issue of shootings. Okay. Are you done? I guess I am. Okay. Just want to answer that uh, through you, Chair. Um, and the task force is a bit of a misnomer. It's not that we had extra officers. We re-diverted re officers from existing complement to do the job. We already talked about the frontline stresses with regard to uh, the backfilling that we have to do on a regular basis. Uh, we also have the guns and gangs within the service that continue to do that work along with drugs and vice. And we continue to work with our counterparts at a provincial level through, as I mentioned, the CFSEU, through CISO. We continue that work. So it's a bit of a misnomer to say there was a task force like it was extra officers and now it's gone. So it's still focused on that. We continue to do that work. Relative to your earlier question about fiscal responsibility, part of the approach on this is that, and you know it through the slide, we're looking at, is there a possible way? This is one of the few areas where we actually recover revenues for the city, we don't get them, for the officers that we're looking at expanding. So in fact, this would be probably revenue neutral, or not revenue neutral, cost neutral, we don't get it out of our budget. You would get it in terms of fines that divert through the POA courts. So again, some of the staffing requirements, you've got the recommendation of the Sexual Assault Community Review Team, and we continue with that. Our cadets, recruiting continues to be an issue. The dedicated traffic safety officers in terms of approach, and as I mentioned, uh, you have as many fatalities as homicides in a given year. People are still dead. The collateral effect is huge. This is an area that combines both leading public issue, and again, the shootings were up when we did our survey. I'm not saying that, I'm insensitive to it, because I'm not, uh, but when you look at the strategy to actually deter these type of things, we believe this is an area where we could expand without really hitting the budget in many cases. It could be self-sustaining. We're doing it as a pilot. We'll see the results of that. Uh, but again, very few areas where we have additional officers added where there's actual revenue generated. And of course, it's contentious. Public can say, oh, you're just looking at generating fines. That's not the case. We're looking at traffic safety. Uh, the shootings continue to be an issue. We continue to do that work. Thank you, Chair, I'll take the chair back, but I stand by my comments. I'm Thank you. incredibly frustrated that it wasn't even brought up. Thank you. Next speaker on the list is Councilor Lloyd Ferguson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. Good to see you again. And uh, I just want to first open my comments by uh, thanking Lois for her service to the sorry, for the service. Um, she had an amazing job to do. She kept me organized. And uh, you know, I, it wasn't an event that I didn't go to that she didn't have me well prepared and uh, give me a heads up on things that are happening. And uh, I think the service is going to miss you significantly, Lois, really, because uh, you're a great resource. I don't envy our current chair having to do his job without you there. I'm sure they'll find a good successor, but I, I just want to again compliment you for the great work. I'm blessed with two of them. I mean, Kathy Bish treats me the same way. I'm spoiled rotten, and by having two people that, um, and, and during my four and a half years on the police board, having Loris um, get me prepared and keep me organized, and for that I, I really appreciate it. Just on to, uh, I've, you know, Councillor Clark got ahead of me. That was the first item on my list. It was his last item, but it's the shootings. And, and I was a little surprised too, Chief, there wasn't a chart on that because clearly it's got a lot of public attention. And, and I know that uh, it's, it's generally all drug related. I, I remember that from when I was on the board. But one ratio I remember we used to keep, there was a big lobby and the previous government got rid of street checks or virtually eliminated street checks. And there was always an interesting ratio 
between the number of street checks we were doing and the number of shootings because um, under the new carding rules, unless things have changed, Chief, because I've been out now for a year, uh, an officer, when he approaches a suspicious person, he has to first tell him, you can walk away if you want to. Is that still the same, where they don't have to give personal information if they don't want to? It's actually not the case, and we can certainly engage in conversation at any time. Uh, the crux of the issue is when you ask somebody for their name and identification. Right. Then and in they, fact, they can walk away if they want to. They can, but we also employ, obviously, um, our legal authorities, so whether it's under the Highway Traffic Act, the Provisional Offences Act, like liquor license, or the criminal code, you have to be able to articulate why it is you're doing what you're doing. I remember at one point we did 4,700 street checks and had seven shootings, and then you see the ratio starts to slip. I know I've, I've, I used to, you know, when they had the, the judge come in and do the review, and I shared all that with them and could, didn't get any traction with them. But um, how many street checks did you do last year? Uh, the report will be coming shortly. Uh, we know that they've dropped substantially. However, what I can tell you is, and uh, some of these arrests that we're talking about are through people being stopped under the Highway Traffic Act, leading to potential visible evidence in the vehicle, which then gives you grounds to exercise your authorities other than criminal code or otherwise. And that's one of the reasons, for example, our enforcement is up last year. We have continued to stress that. You have to have the legal method to get at the problem. Uh, so whether it's recognize somebody in a warrant, which we've also seen, making the arrest, you then find drugs, potentially firearms. This week, uh, one of the firearms was under the front seat loaded. We also see a number of other firearms. So again, it's not that, in, to say a task force will do all the work, uh, this is a problem for our front line as well as our investigative services areas to address. Okay, so you did do some street checks last year? I don't have the final figure. Uh, I think last year, not, you know, 2018, I believe we're around five or six. Uh, they've diminished from your 4,700 number. Yeah, and, and of course, it's always a concern. And, and um, I know the previous government felt that, and in fact, our, our former deputy has gone to Halifax and put in place the elimination of street checks again down there for the political reasons and, and trying to uh, avoid the perception of being biased by race. Um, but I'm just worried that as Councillor Clark says, is there's a ratio of the, the shootings have spiked as the street checks have gone down. And so the bad guys may be feeling more comfortable carrying guns now because they're not subjected to those same questions and ask for identification. Um, the second point I wanted to make is, is, like, is, is one thing that troubled me, and I'm just a lowly poor counselor now, I'm no longer your board chair. And so one thing that struck me as a counselor is I have a hot spot in my community. It's a cut through area where um, there's a busy intersection at Russo and Wilson. And so they cut down the academy and, and I, I get lots of complaints about speeding. So I tried to talk to your crimes officer about that. And he just says, we need more police. And then I stopped a beat officer in the area and I says, can you just, and you have time, just set up on, on Academy Street. And you know, it says, we need more officers. So it seems like we give you 25 more officers and this is the first time I've had that feedback that you need more officers when we just give you 25. I, I assume the senior command was coaching them to tell us that uh, because why is it suddenly happening? But um, I just wanted to provide that feedback to you and how it surprised me uh, to get that kind of reaction uh, when we just put through in our 2019 budget to put in 25 more officers. I can't answer that question. Okay, Definitely not senior management. Uh, I'm not going to pin the association, but this is a dialogue going on provincially in terms of number of officers. As you can see, we're below the median, and that's fine. Our available time has decreased, and that's why the board last year actually added those additional officers. We were in a case between uh, retirements and otherwise, so we couldn't actually fill all those spots. And we're facing that same issue uh, with all the police services across Canada. That's, again, one of the reasons for the cadets. So no, you think, oh, sorry. Sorry, we, we would not coach them to say that. In fact, relative to your earlier question, since the COI legislation, collection of information, certain circumstances, prohibitions and duties, I didn't create that name, that's what it's called. I know. Yeah, you gotta rehearse it because it's a mouthful. Um, I forgot it. Right, that's okay. So part of the issue is it's not just that you abdicate or you drive by, it's know your legal authorities, as I mentioned. We stress that since the inception of this. And we continue to see that work by the front line, whether it's people doing break and enters, parolees out, 
those who are up to uh, no good from other jurisdictions. And I can tell you relative to the shootings, what we have followed through and determined who is responsible. We're looking at people from Brampton, from Toronto, some cases from Niagara. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, citizens within our community. It's the broader effect. So no, we wouldn't coach them to that, and never would. And uh, our people to continue to do that work. Um, that could be a dialogue otherwise. I know the association has been quite vocal about the staffing issues. You were at the business plan. They raised it. It was a leading issue from our internal scan. Staffing. Okay, I appreciate that feedback. It never struck me the association was coaching them to do that. I haven't said that, but I'm just saying their position and is. And last year was a bargaining year too and, and may have triggered some of it also, although I understand you do have a multi-year collective agreement now that was put in place, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Three years. And my last question is, uh, is, is a trend that I've seen in, so how many officers, uh, you know, sworn officers do you have off right now, either being accommodated or light duty, uh, WSIB or PTSD? And again, we came prepared, uh, if I can turn that over to our CAO, Anna Felice, she has that answer for you. Okay, Anna? Thank you for the question through the chair. Um, so currently, uh, as of the end of 2018, our 2019 numbers aren't... Uh, 2018? I've got the 18 numbers. Our 2019 numbers aren't absolutely final yet. We had 41 off on WSIB, and we had an additional 61 that were in the workplace but on an accommodated basis. Uh, having said that, that was total WSIB, not just mental health. Okay, you said that kind of quick. Uh, and can you repeat I just want to, so you had 61 accommodated and 41 additional on WSIB, and how many on PTSD? So of those, um, so PTSD is a diagnosis under mental health, so I don't know specifically how many of those were PTSD. I can say that for mental health, uh, I would say the majority of the, the folks that were off, uh, about 37 of them at that time were for mental health. 37 of the 61. Of the 41 that were off. Of the accommodated, I, uh, I don't have that stat. I just know that we've got 61 in the so workplace. So in total, we have 102 officers who are not on the street every day? Uh, so we've got 61 of that 102 that are accommodated. Um, in, mo in many cases, they don't have a use of force option, which is why we have to accommodate them. Um, so that would if, if impact their ability to be out on the street in the front line capacity. So just for clarity purposes, then, when they're unaccommodated, they're in doing desk jobs. They're not out doing traffic enforcement because they can't carry a weapon, as I understand it, as I recall. Uh, so they're doing administrative work. They're not doing police work. Police? Through the chair, for the most part, they're doing um, administrative policing duties. They're accommodated still to uh, police-type work, uh, but typically not out on the street. If I could just step on that one quickly. Uh, we took to the board, as you know, our case prep unit, which is the Crown Brief Preparation, criminal charges, largely, uh, for court. We staff that actually predominantly with accommodated officers. What that frees up, and we did the study years back, was about 12 officers on the front line per year in terms of cost avoidance. So we do use accommodated officers. If they don't have use of force abilities to do police work, it's not make work. It's meant to supplement the front line and reduce impact on frontline where we can. So a accommodated officer can't do traffic control, traffic enforcement? Uh, they would have to have use of force options if they're out in public, yes, that's correct. The answer is no. Correct. Okay. And, and so, you know, the, and I'm gonna use the wrong expression here, but uh, self-determined PSD, that's new uh, for first responders. Um, since that came in place, and, and I know this is not specific just to Hamilton, mm -hmm. I think it's across the province. Is it not correct that since they can, what is the proper term? It's not self-determined. It's presumptive uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in legislation uh, in terms of WSIB claims. The fire department had it years ago, particularly with the rates of cancer, things like that. Paramedics have it now too, don't they? I'm not sure on that one. I think they were looking to expand. I'm getting nodding from over there. I know it was in the works, but yes, that came in about three years ago. But to draw a distinction again, you have PTSD, which has to be diagnosed by a professional. You also have occupational stress injury, which is similar, but not exactly the same. So both factor into that. And yes, some organizations are seeing between 15 and 25% of their front line affected. How much, 15 to 20? 15 to 25%. We Since that new legislation come in. Correct. And we have had conversations both with the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Health, 
and our own Solicitor General about that. Because if you have 102 officers off, that's probably why we don't have enough frontline people. And, and uh, It's a major effect. Huge, 102 officers. And you're, you asked us for 25 last year, another seven this year. There's 102 officers there, particularly when 37 are mental health related. And, uh, you know, I, the province went through this legislation to, you know, for first responders to, but, but what's happened now, and it, you get other services that are 15 to 25 percent to the province, it, it appeases the, um, the police associations to do this, but it doesn't cost them anything because it's dumped back to the municipality to pay for it. And, and so, through again to the chief, chief, is the um, Ontario Association of Police Chiefs or the Ontario Association of Police Service Boards dealing with these statistics with the province? As I say, we met, and the reason I was at the meeting with the ministers was exactly that, to meet with both the Solicitor General Ministry of Health. Part of our push, and when it was in, uh, put in place, there was a guarantee that WSIB would provide resources up front and interventions with the members who disclosed to get them back to work sooner with the proper supports in place. That hasn't happened for a number of years. That was the subject of the discussion with both ministries. We believe that needs to be done. That was a bit of the promise. And we knew that coming in, that the sooner you do interventions and provide resources, much like the mental health and the general public that I talked about earlier, then the odds of getting people back to work happen sooner. So that work still needs to be done. The other trend you're seeing with regard to um, physicians in some cases, are recommending that the employee have no contact with the organization. We've done the research on that. It's not the case. There's a certain employee-employer obligation to stay connected. So we're looking at it multifaceted, yes. Because we're running, I just did the numbers, we're running around 11% now of employees who are either accommodated or on WSIB with 37 of those being mental health. Before the presumptive PTSD legislation came into force, how many would you have had off then? Uh, it was substantially lower. It has grown post uh, PTSD. I don't have the number right in front of me. Uh, I th believe we're around the six to seven percent category. Okay. That's all WSIB too. I can't because we didn't wasn't captured necessarily as a discrete item, and our CEO just spoke to that. Uh, also with WSIB, it's a little bit difficult to get those exact figures for what part was injuries, what part was. Uh, mental health in terms of occupational stress, and then another part being the presumptive PTSD. Right. And again, to your point, just because you say, I have PTSD, it's not a self-diagnosis. It has to be diagnosed. It is under diagnostic statistical medicine. Now, Three, Mr. Judge, does the service have the right to get a second opinion with the service's psychiatrist? Uh, we don't have a service psychiatrist. And you don't have one on, on contract? We do have psychiatrists available for other reasons, but generally speaking, no, you aren't entitled to do that unless I'm wrong, Anna. Second diagnosis. Lisa. Uh, through the chair, so um, typically an employer has the option for independent medical examinations, and they can ask for that through a variety of um, specialists. Uh, we've not been successful uh, to date in, in uh, getting cooperation for independent medical examinations, not specific to mental health, but in any scenario. Counselor. Okay, I'm choosing my words here carefully, Mr. Chairman. Yep. I'm not identifying anybody, and, and, and uh, but this is why we have a shortage of police officers, quite frankly. And we, we got 11% of our officers are off for a variety of reasons, but 37% with mental, mental health, PTSD. Um, and I don't know what it's like in fire, or what it's like in, if, if paramedics are included, but maybe something for us to follow up on to do those comparators. So that's all my questions at this time, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nan, if you could come up and take the podium. My apologies to the Chief. I appreciate the previous it. meeting, so I have to move on. My apologies to Councillors. Uh, the next speaker on the list is Councillor Danko. And not to be facetious, Deputy Mayor, I do appreciate the questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, welcome, Chief. A Thank couple you. of questions that are things that stood out through your presentation. Uh, first of all, the, the cannabis uh, dispensaries, that was a major issue when we all took office back in 2018. Um, you mentioned specifically the ones on Upper James that were you know, a particular concern for residents in Ward 8. And uh, you know, at the time, I was somewhat skeptical and, and critical of the police response, but uh, 
seeing that through, I think you deserve quite a bit of credit for the work that's been done on that and going from 53 to zero is, uh, is a major achievement that deserves recognition. Thank you. Um, the second is on, on traffic safety. Uh, your stats for the, your work on the Red Hill Valley Parkway, I think really show a case study of how important it is to have that police enforcement out on the roads so that people see it to influence driver behavior. I mean, the statistics there, a 45% reduction in collisions is um, substantial. So again, the, the work that you've done there is uh, deserves to be highlighted. It's, it's excellent. And of course, and, and I mean this, the city supported the special duties to do exactly that as targeted enforcement. And we do know from the research that sometimes it requires the officers to actually stop and have the conversations, issue the offense notice, make a determination in terms of discretion, be the full amount or partial. We've also included there, which I didn't highlight, many were above 50 kilometers per hour, which of course is racing. So you tow the car, uh, you, I guess it's got to be a deterrent. And of course the fines are substantial. So uh, again, appreciate the work of uh, council, largely driven, I believe, through Councillor Collins. Uh, to get that in place, and then we could see the metrics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on the same traffic enforcement, um, with adding, I think it was, was eight um, dedicated traffic safety officers, as, as we've mentioned numerous times, and, and it's interesting that your community consult consultations reveal the same thing that, that I'm hearing from our community, is traffic safety is just such a huge priority for people, and, and they kind of see that on the one side there is the speeding concerns that increase the severity of collisions and, and injuries, but it's also the the day to day of enforcement of aggressive driving, um, distracted driving, people rolling stop signs, uh, passing too close to cyclists, as you've mentioned, um, dangerous right turns that put pedestrians in danger, and those are all things that you really need a human officer on the ground to. Uh, to uh, have their eyes on what's happening and be able to, to have that enforcement. And this is something that, ironically, just at the last public works meeting, we were requesting. So you've, you've uh, beat us to the punch on that, which is, is great to see. And, and especially in, in your comments that um, this has the potential to be, if not rev revenue neutral, but you know, there is, there is a return on this investment, and it's something that I think uh, residents have really been asking for. Just a quick comment, if I might, Councillor, through you, Chair, is I've also got the uh, municipal benchmark numbers for the Canada performance, and looking at, and I don't mean to throw my counterparts under the bus, uh, the jurisdiction. So, for example, Durham has 68,000 uh, fences, uh, Hamilton 81,000. If I look at Niagara, which is about similar in size, 31,000 offense notices. And of course, this also combines Ministry of Environment and a few others, but we do the bulk of enforcement. Uh, so what I wouldn't want to lose, and this is a message for my front line as well, that's predominantly being done through our current divisional safety officers and our front line. So there's an expectation when you're out in the street that you will probably see a traffic violation and should in fact either do speeding, the stop signs, the red lights, uh, so I'm not looking to diminish uh, the participation of our front line in continuing traffic safety. When I look at law enforcement and public safety, it's a big piece of it. Yes, seizing the guns, but also the traffic stop for speeding. My old line was Val tags are the root of all evil. You've got an administrative offense. Well, guess what? Our criminals probably aren't up to date on their administrative requirements. Now I have a legal authority to stop. As I say, if I've got evidence in plain view, then I'm able to use the other legislative authorities that I have to get at those other things. We know stolen autos often begins that way. So it's the attentiveness to the driving. And if you're a criminal and you're participating in guns and gangs or otherwise, then you're probably going to be transporting in a vehicle. So this is a way to get at the other issue. It's not as direct, but we're certainly alive to the issue. And the reason I say that is, our members, it used to be pretty infrequent to find a gun in a car. Not so much anymore. It's not a good thing, but we have to be attentive to that from an officer safety perspective and a public safety perspective as well. We've looked at the research. Probably your leading uh, issue around uh, risk is doing a traffic stop. However, having said that, you generally deal with the vast members of the public. 
Um, when I was in traffic, we used to get complaints phoned in, and it was mentioned earlier. Sometimes I would get the person who complained about it, who then said, well, I phoned. I know that. That's the reason I'm here, and that's the reason you're getting an offense notice. I don't mean hard-hearted. It said it's equitable application of the law in those circumstances. So certainly support what you were saying. We tried to be responsible in terms of the approach in a difficult year with provincial cuts. That's why I haven't asked you, for example, 15 members dedicated to guns and gangs. Then I would have to look for potential grant funding, and over the long term, that just doesn't happen. Thank you. Um, and to continue on the, the conversation about guns and gangs, um, in Ward 8 on the West Central Mountain this year, we did have a couple targeted shootings, um, stabbings, um, and when residents, the response to residents is, while well, it was targeted, as, as Councillor Clark alluded to as well, you know, sure, your one neighbor was targeted, but if you live next door, that's not exactly, um, you know, comforting for you. And to just the thought of those kinds of things happening in our neighborhoods on what is seemingly a more regular basis is a huge concern for, for residents. Um, so and you've, you've already answered this question, but I, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, the concern in the community for these types of, of things. And it's, it's not uh, sufficient for us to just say, well, it, you know, it was targeted, don't worry about it, which at times kind of seems to be the message that, that we're portraying. Just a comment on that. I think what we're trying to do in our original releases, and it's not just our jurisdiction, is this just arbitrary or was the person potentially involved in criminal activity? We know they have drugs and all those other things. I agree with you. It gives me small consolation. And as I've said publicly, they aren't taking firearm safety courses. They're picking up the, the firearms. They're shooting them arbitrarily. In some cases, they're converting over uh, flare guns to a 22 caliber. All kinds of risk issues here. I agree with that. In terms of the determination of the motivation, and I know that the counselor, for example, said it's mistaken identity. I don't know that yet in that investigation. In fact, that investigation continues. Detective Sergeant Berzuk came out with some public statements, but you never really know until you get to the destination and find out what you find out. That's why these investigations take so long. We do know, relative to the Canadian experience, we are seeing guns and gangs. It is tied to money. It is tied to drugs. And the propensity to enact violence perhaps is creeping up from the States. I don't know. I do know that the source of many of the guns are either stolen weapons from lawful owners who may even have them properly secured. And the states, all you have to do is go down to one of those flea markets. It's unbelievable. In certain states, not all of them, we have automatic weapons uh, and handguns just laying out on a table. We all share the concerns about what is the vetting process for somebody to actually get that firearm. So agreed, it is multifaceted, and that's not to deflect but requires a more comprehensive strategy, and we are working with our partners uh, routinely on this. Thank you. Um, another point that uh, that I wanted to raise is um, is the issue of, of hate and intolerance and the police response, which I, I didn't see in the presentation either. Um, in particular, from my perspective, I was at uh, one of the main protests, whatever you want to call it, at Mohawk College, I saw firsthand the um, professionalism that your officers approached that situation with. Um, I can't say enough about uh, how well I thought that they performed in that very volatile situation. But at the same time, there is a, a perception of how the police are uh, approaching these events who's being arrested, who's not being arrested, and just kind of the, the growing concern about hate and intolerance in our society. So I'll just give you the opportunity to address that. Certainly, and I mean, this is not a new phenomenon for Hamilton. I believe it's been misrepresented. We started a hate crime unit in the 90s, uh, particularly a hate crime investigator. If you recall with the burning of the Hindu Samaj, there was great prominence, particularly with Islamophobia post 911, and that was the source of that particular Firebombing. They thought it was a mosque. It wasn't. It was a Samaj. It really is immaterial. You had tremendous devastation for that community. With regard to hate bias crimes, some jurisdictions only you have to have two parts to a hate crime. You have to 
criminal offense itself, and you have to have the hate or bias aspect. We took as a strategy many years ago to also capture hate bias incidents. So racial epithet without a particular crime, that's what it is. Are you allowed to say that? Provided you're not advocating certain offenses under the criminal code, unfortunately, yes. Does that make it right? Definitely not. But we wanted to capture that so that when we deal with an offender down the road, and the idea is not to have it precipitate to an actual criminal offense, that we do interventions early and where we have identification of those people. So I think what's happened in the general media and the particular verbiage that you're using is inaccurate. If you look at similar communities, both with regard to the diversity in the community and the population rate, we already know it's underreported. If you're not um, advocating for reporting of it, then you're going to see reductions. And we see that in some of the communities. Quite frankly, I don't believe some of the statistics because I know it's underreported. If you actually look at the events that are reported, we do know that predominantly involves mischief, which is graffiti, assaults, there are particular populations of the, uh, or particular sectors within the population that are targeted, and we have captured those statistics for many years. I mean, I have those statistics. That doesn't negate the fact, to your point about uh, demonstrations that are occurring, the limitations, and again, it's not that we just enter in this arbitrarily. We're governed by the Constitution. It's a supreme law. We're governed by what the courts have decided is reasonable. We've seen that. In terms of Toronto, I turned to Deputy Bergen because he saw these events in Toronto many years back, whether it's stake marches, um, intolerance, all the rest of that stuff. So we don't just get weighed in because we believe it's morally improper and say you can't do that. And I'd love to, but you can't. You have to follow the law. We're in law enforcement. Where we can work with our partners towards better, <clears throat> and I look to the Hindu Samaj, for example, where he finally made an arrest in that event years later through disclosure, then, I, in fact, I went up and met with the executive at that time to know what their position was going to be. And I didn't come to the exclusion, they did. They said, we're gonna follow our doctrine from inception, which was, their words, not mine, forgiveness, redemption, that's the position they're going to take. I'm not saying that's always the right approach. But I do know that if you get into a violent back and forth, it certainly doesn't help anybody in the public. <coughs> Pardon me, and you certainly witnessed to it at that particular event that you attended. What I can tell you to, I'll call it disparity in arrests, we will arrest anybody who commits that criminal offense. There have been suggestions that I intervene and tell certain people not to be prosecuted for assault of offenses. What happens is I would be charged with obstruct justice, and there's case law to that. Our officers have individual discretion to enact their powers and arrest authorities. And we'll continue that, and we continue to promote people coming forward disclosures. <coughs> Pardon me. It's a little dry up here. Mr. Bingo, did you have further questions? N not on, on that issue, and, and I appreciate your, you know, <coughs> sorry, your um, you. thorough answer on that, and, and it is something that, that has been very important to the community over the, the past year. Um, my last question, and, and I think this is more <coughs> chair to, uh, to the clerk, is, is on the budget. So with the council's mandate was a 2% increase and uh, we're looking at a 4.02% increase. So through you, Madam Chair, what would our options be if, uh, if we wanted to look for, or ask the police to look for further efficiencies on that? Could would this be referred back to the Police Services Board? Clerk Papillo? Through you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy Mayor, yes, if that's committee's wish, you would refer the presentation and the budget back to the Hamilton Police Services Board, I would assume with some direction, um, and ask them to report back. So I'll listen to the rest of the, the speakers, but uh, I, I will consider that at the end of uh, this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Farr. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Hi, Chief. Welcome back. Morning, Councillor. Through you, uh, first on the traffic enforcement unit, I think, uh, I, I want to uh, commend, I know the board pushed for this, and I want to commend the board and uh, your team for working together to, I think, satisfy uh, uh, maybe even a greater need than what's being uh, projected here. Uh, certainly, as you know, I, I, I have the honor of working in a very engaged ward where there's neighborhood associations and 
you uh, be at more BIAs than anywhere else in the city, and, and you've been at some of those meetings as well. Um, I get a lot of engagement on traffic issues, and and um, this in, this engaged ward um, has been informed many times over the years by your specifically your crime managers that you know we deploy based on the calls that come to us. Mm -hmm. So if you don't call, we don't know that there's this hot spot here, whether it's traffic safety or, or break-in entries. So will deployment work the same way for this new team? Um, the more you hear about a stop sign getting run at that intersection or speeding over on Queen South, that, that that'll help you in determining where those officers need to be through you. Uh, great question, and uh, Deputy Diodati will have kind of how it's gonna work in terms of do we consolidate with our existing divisional safety officers? Do we deploy in a decentralized model? Uh, but I can tell you from a complaint-based system, and even when I worked in traffic, you have your standing complaints, you had a responsibility to go out and either do the measurement to see if it's there or not, if it is there to address it with enforcement. And as I say, in the East End in particular, where you have over 2,000 intersections controlled by stop signs, you can only imagine right. that there are many, many complaints and it, you know, it requires a, a vast amount of resources to do that. But again, it's not just the DSOs, it's not just this, this particular traffic enforcement, it's our front line as well. To your point about beat crime managers, it's a great way to um, filter through those issues, disseminate it out. So I would see our beat crime managers working closely, much like they do with the DSOs, divisional safety officers, with wherever these particular uh, traffic officers land. And lastly, it is rural and urban, and I know my rural counterparts are looking for this, whether it's Waterdown, uh, Brenda Johnson, up in Alfreda, it's everywhere. So the whole idea is this is a citywide response, right. not particular, but I agree with you in terms of the tactics, is you do your referrals through your beat crime managers for those complaints. Right. And you listed off other things other than speeding yep. in answer to a previous question. Uh, regarding perhaps photo radar taking uh, taking off some of the loads, so there are there is a long list. Did I hear you say through you, Chair, that the the new officers, the gals and girls in blue, the eight of them would all, it, provided that all of this is approved, would be uh, covering ride now as well. Your ride program, or is that still uh, uh, where we've done that traditionally? And I wouldn't see it taking um, over completely because the main focus, well, it's all traffic safety, but our uh, divisional units do ride on a regular basis. We went years back to a year-long deployment, not just at um, the holiday weekends. So we continue to do that work. Okay. We actually constructed a form that talks about traffic-assisted ride programs. So you could have an officer from traffic that assists for that short stint, and then goes on to do the regular enforcement. So it's a balance. Okay. Um, and finally, on on this. The cost recovery is intriguing to me, and you tried to explain it. I maybe didn't catch it fully. Uh, one of the things, and I actually talked to Board Member Collins about this briefly last Thursday, and then I had to run to the general. But I'm wondering, is this the only area where we can get cost recovery out of our policing objectives, or are there other areas being explored? And exactly how, how does it work? Uh, one more time, and maybe uh, this simpleton. No, no, and that's a fair question because it ain't so simple. Oh. Is we generate revenue currently for any provincial offense notice that we lay. That money gets funneled, I think, I can't remember how long they go to change it, arrives at the municipality, not to the police service. So right. we've never collected revenue that way. It would still remain that way. And I would turn to Mr. Zagarek. What would that look like? My understanding of preliminary discussions is, and this is a pilot, you don't normally fund pilots. You don't normally do the transfer of funds. Quite frankly, that would be half, the council would have to approve that were they to go there. What we're trying to show you is, um, and that can be a determination, in my view, after the pilot, once we actually get the metrics, find out what the actual uh, fines are that are laid, do all that behind the scenes work. Um, so currently there is no mechanism. Could it be done? Sure, I think with a motion of council. Is it accounting practice? My sense from Mr. Zagarek is it's not. So it would require a change. However, other jurisdictions, I know Deputy Bergen has checked with Ottawa, for example. I can't remember if it was Durham or not. Some of them have looked at funding police services around traffic from the red light cameras or the automatic speed equipment that's out. 
but that's a relatively new change in terms of how municipalities are doing business. So I hope that answers it because I agree. It, it does. I mean, simple. it sounds like there's a there's a kind of a, we're making efforts to change the way we fund certain aspects Correct. of policing, and not only in Hamilton, and Ottawa is also an example. I will ask through you, Chair Mike, if you wanted to comment on the way he sees it from uh, from his perch. So through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, the Chief's correct in that uh, the city re realizes the net proceeds of uh, Provincial Offense Act charges, uh, including those that are, uh, are actioned by Hamilton Police Services, and that's reported through our corporate financials. The, uh, also, the Chief's correct in that that uh, direct relationship as it relates to the proceeds and the activity, and Police Services activity, uh, they can't be twinned in that when POA was downloaded to municipalities from the province, it precluded uh, police services from directly benefiting from the POA revenues. So the one mechanism would be for there to be a uh, accounting exercise of chargebacks and recoveries, uh, and that is something that uh, we could investigate and review that could be applied towards netting off some of the uh, expenditures against Hamilton Police Services, and my final comment being similar to the uh, pilot that was approved at Council last night, uh, we would have to also investigate the POA administration and the POA prosecution activities that may stem from this pilot project, and so report back with that information as well. Great, well, I'll watch with interest, I appreciate it. Um, quick answers on this because uh, it's, uh, a stretch to call it budget related, but I'm, I'm curious given that we're gonna be cutting a ribbon in a few months and you did uh, bring it up in the slides. So the investigative services building, I'm trying to remember, I was trying to Google while you were answering some other questions, Chief. I, square footage was a big issue. You had a lot of officers squeezed in and I can't, I, you know, I remember back in 2011 or 10, there was a chart that you showed other cities and the kind of the square space per staff, not just officers. So. How is that being accommodated now? Could you, do you happen to recall where we're at and where we're going to be now that we have the space? So really two new buildings added and a few ba years back was of course a multi-agency training academy, ourselves fire EMS. So that reduced the need. Uh, with the investigative services building coming on board, we hit about the median and I don't have the figure in front of me, I don't see Dan Bowman That's fine. Here. But yeah, we're meeting what the average requirement is. That's good. And, um, you had investigative service officers at three different locations throughout the city. All of them now will be under one roof with one command. Um, and so I'm, I, I can't recall as well, how, where are they coming from outside of downtown? So predominantly Division 1, but that's, also that's Division downtown. 3. Right. We'll anticipate where you're going, and we'll be bringing a report on the Space Reallocation Committee, chaired by CAO and also Deputy Bergen, done a ton of work. We just got a presentation this week on kind of a template for how it would work for repurposing a space. What I'll say is it's delivered about what are the you know, relationships that work in terms of workflow, what does the public expect in terms of use of that space, uh, what are the members looking for, what do we anticipate in the horizon, either for uh, changes in our complement, we have to increase, for example, the women's uh, locker room, and shared spaces, gender neutral spaces, all that's incorporated in this work. So it's predominantly division one and three, and then we're looking at repurposing that space, but it also includes division two and indirectly with some of the shifts from our multi-agency training academy. So, so numbers coming from all over the city at right. different locations now. Okay, and finally uh, through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, um, of course, you know I'm gonna to have to ask you about this beat officer. So I see total property crime rate um, is up 4%. We've had some issues downtown, nothing new to you. You've, again, attended the BIA meetings and also many of your reps have attended these BIA meetings. It's been a request, we went through the board uh, officially here today through you, Chair, request denied given the challenges, correct? Uh, maybe not that assertively, but yes. However, it's distri distribution of resource. Sorry, finish. No, no, I, I, I'm fine. I, I have to follow up on behalf of the, the BIAs, and, and I wanted to. So through you, there are um, a plenty of, uh, uh, there's lots of policing going on in, in downtown. There's still issues. Uh, you're there. You even talked about a few with uh, 
the way you're working the perimeter and working collaboratively with uh, our uh, safe injection and consumption site. Uh, and, and we do see the action officers, we see the mounted. So is there a way going forward we can bring some peace of mind and maybe some of those, let's use as an example, new business folks who maybe saw a rash of B&Es for a short period of time um, and, and maybe had some bear uh, activity attention uh, to those uh, outbursts. Um, but the ones who just want to feel, and I, you and I, I, we've talked about it, I completely understand this, the perception of this friendly neighborhood officer brings peace of mind, particularly to the business owners, but also the residents within the uh, uh, commercial hub of the city. So is there something we can do to offer some solace there? Uh, it, maybe uh, uh, some grid or graph that shows the investments we're making in your people in this place, when and where in the near future, just to sort of say, maybe not a beat officer twirling a baton, saying good morning and having a cup of coffee, but here's what you should be seeing regularly. Through you, Chair, final comments on that. And thank you, and through you, Chair. Uh, Deputy Bergen this week actually just uh, provided a presentation through Community Mobilization Division, which incorporates mobile, or sorry, mounted patrol in action. It's actually done a GPS um, tracking of where the, those officers deployed. So we can actually provide that citywide now, it's the first time I saw it this week, uh, for the distribution of what time was spent where uh, by those officers. And I think to your point, you asked about a graph. Uh, you know, Perfect. My, uh, uh, my learned deputy is anticipated, provided this week. I found it actually very compelling because again, I've talked about in rural areas, for example, and I worked out in Flamborough, people wouldn't know you're there. Some of the driveways are, you know, half right. a mile long. They say, well, I never see an officer. Well, you've got to be standing in your laneway to see us drive by. Uh, the alternate, was I've said with the fire department, this is facetious. Perhaps I should have lights and siren on all the time, and then you know I was there, kind of like the fire department. Sure. But people don't want that disturbance. So I think, yes, this is a great approach uh, through the deputy's work, and I think we'll be better positioned specifically to answer the request, not just the downtown BIA, but Ottawa Street, Stony Creek, Concession Street, all those BIAs to say, here's where we actually deployed. The last piece on the action strategy, as you know, uh, introduced by my predecessor, was really focused on the high crime areas. That's how deployment worked. We've seen reductions. We then started to spread those resources across the city. So we also track that piece as well. And when you talk about a wellness piece, let's talk about a shooting, we have strategically deployed our mounted patrol or action to go out in those areas post, if there's any collateral after the fact or evidence, and we're looking to do that. So pending any uh, comments from Deputy Bill. Actually, I'll let uh, Deputy Chief conclude and then I'll be through. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate the presentation again. Uh, are you breaking it down, for, uh, Deputy Chief Bergen? Not just cruisers, you're gonna tell us where mount, what mounteds are, where the actions are, uh, foot patrol. Is it broken down that way, your work that the Chief just uh, told us about? Thank you very much for your question through the chair. Um, we have a, a pilot project where we are actually um, tracking through GPS what is the activities of our action officers. On top of that, uh, I think you're fully aware as well, working with our crime managers, uh, we do have a um, relationship with BIAs and we are attending to manage those um, issues as they emerge. You are right about sustainability, not only in the aftermath of an event, but it is important to have a sense of safety and security. So we'll continue to monitor that and report back accordingly. Great, but I heard the chief say through you, just for my own clarity, you're gonna be, you're, you've done some work now that shows where policing is at all times, I'm guessing. Is it not just cruisers, it's, is it also broken down to the different, you know, groups like your action teams, your mounteds, your, what's, where they are too, or are you just tracking cars with a GPS through you, just so I'm clear. Yeah, well, it, that's a fair question, and through the chair, uh, we haven't gone to the point of, of tacking a, a GPS to a mounted officer, uh, but at the same time, we are fully aware of where our members are, and we report every day about its activities and its involvements, both through uh, community events, but also through um, proactive patrol. We will continue to address and monitor and be more specific uh, as the need requires. Thank you, Councillor. Do we go to Councillor Wilson? Thank you, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I, I just have a few, uh, one or two questions, uh, I think related to performance indicators. But uh, before I did that, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to perhaps um, 
further clarify, at least for my benefit. Uh, you said uh, with respect to, I think you were responding to Councillor Danko's observation that the presentation was silent on hate crimes. Um, and in response to the issue of statistics, I think you said, I believe it has been misrepresented. And I, I didn't quite understand your answer. And if I could ask you to just clarify. Sure. And I, I mean, I don't want to repeat the phrase, but we're talking about hate in. Um, as I said, the way we collect data, the way it's collected in other communities is not congruent. We've been proactive to incorporate both actual hate crimes, with the crime component plus uh, the hate bias aspect. Hate bias incidents we've also collected for years. So I know when the national statistics came out, uh, the view was, well, it's disproportionate in Hamilton or we're the leaders. Well, in my view, it's synonymous to like child abuse. As you increase awareness, as you get increased reporting, it's not that it is um, increasing the numbers, it's in revealing the numbers that were already there. And I believe it's underreported in many other jurisdictions. So because of our history here, both post-911, with the Hindu Samaj, with having a hate crime investigators back in the 90s, before any of that occurred, we have placed a particular focus on those. And as I say, we know who the predominant victims have been through the years. We know the nature of the offenses largely mischiefs, largely uh, level one assaults, which is the lower end, not that it isn't traumatic. And we also know the nature of what that particular discrimination or bias or hate component is on the reported instances. So I think you need to know that in order to address it specifically. So I think the misnomer is the, the moniker that's been assigned to Hamilton, which in my view is inappropriate, and well, maybe an interesting dialogue, I don't think it's accurate. Councillor Wilson? So just, I just want to make sure I understand. So you're reporting that because um, we, rep we record everything, um, it is r revealing um, and significant, but that other communities perhaps in their reporting uh, aren't reporting everything. Oh, sorry? Not reporting I don't that know which that we do. Yeah, I think it's not reported in the first instance, which is a major issue. For the, that that is reported, we include both hate crimes that actually meet the test, but also hate bias incidents. So we have both dimensions. Some do not report the hate bias incidents, nor do they collect it actively. Thank you. Um, the um, traffic safety has dominated much of this discussion. It certainly is an issue in, in Ward 1. Um, as, you, as you may know, Ward 1 has the highest uh, percentage of multimodal split in that we, our community in Ward 1, were designed for walkability for the most part, and uh, we enjoy that. Um, we also um, would like to cycle more and like to walk more safely. Particularly, um, we encourage our children to walk to school. Um, and I, I'm just curious, because I have been asked, and I, I don't know the answer, um, what, how does the police service determine where they set up their enforcement units? It's actually multifaceted. It's based on complaints. We also do statistical analysis with the city for high accident intersections and look at the deployment there. Uh, but it's a combination of both relative to, and we've done this a number of years, uh, education around pedestrian safety. Uh, we have seen an increase in the number of pedestrian-related uh, fatalities this year. Uh, a few years back, we saw it largely around a senior's residence, so we went there specifically to do an education piece. Uh, and very simply, what they were doing is crossing uh, multi-lane roadways, say like a five-lane uh, stretch on Main Street, not using the crosswalks because it was inconvenient. And then what you have is they're either shielded from view by the other traffic and end up getting hit in an inside curb lane or otherwise. It's multifaceted in terms of determination. From a divisional issue, we look at the complaints that come in, but also if we know that there's high accidents in that location, it's a combination. We also work with uh, the traffic safety, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the committee, it's through the city, it involves public health, ourselves, uh, city traffic, other agencies that look at injuries and otherwise, of approaches that have engineering applications, education applications and enforcement applications. So what was raised at the board uh, this week, for example, was a stretch, 
uh, Councillor uh, Jackson raised it. Stretch on Upper Ottawa by Redbury, which when I was in traffic, that was an issue. And I know from out there on patrol that any four-lane roadway tends to lend to speeding. So if you think about Upper Paradise, for example, they re-engineered it to make it one way in each direction, not two lanes, with a center lane for turning. That, in fact, had an effect on the speeding. So, I know that's a complete answer, but we look at it from a variety of perspectives. Can you re-engineer it? Can you put a bollard in with a turn lane where you have collisions so people can't turn anymore? That seems to me to be a very logical solution versus going out and handing 100 tickets. Can you redesign, for example, the roundabouts where that avoids T-bone uh, collisions? So some of it is engineering, some of it is enforcement. Where the enforcement is involved, we rely both on the statistics, the complaints, and also what we observe ourselves. Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, the, um, what's not clear to me, is the amount of money ha that has been allocated to enforcement over, say, the last five years. Is that reported somewhere? Uh, we don't, sorry, and through you, Deputy Mayor, or Thank you. Deputy Chair, is we don't actually break that out. This is one of the first times we have said, uh, studying what the effects of a divisional safety officer, the revenue that would generate it through fines, what would that possibly be? But we have not reported that on a routine basis. The other problem is, uh, as I said, I have enforcement from the front line. We don't break out the time span that they're dedicated to doing strictly enforcement as a capture of what they generated versus the time they spent doing that work. Thank you. Um, in terms of performance indicators, um, when an officer is on shift, um, and you record all the calls that that officer makes per shift. Do we have, a, do you keep a record, and is it publicly available, of how many arrests are made per shift, and in terms of those calls, how many of those calls are actually an arrest is made? Uh, not specifically that. We do look, look at workload distribution in terms of time spent on calls. So whether it's a noise complaint, traffic control, um, trespass figures prominently, strangely enough, in Division 3 for time-consuming call. Uh, but the actual, as a performance indicator, I said I made this many arrests during, and that, of course, would include provincial offences stuff unless it's suspended driving. We don't normally require, um, record those. And even in terms of dispositions by the Attorney General, they don't generally look at arrest convictions, all those kind of metrics. Thank you. Um, This is, for me, uh, when I'm, I'm looking at this, a, a record, for the most part, of falling crime rates. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it's more appropriately put to our uh, budget director here at the city through you, um, Chair Nan. Um, Mr. Zagarek, do we, would we be able to, or have we in the past, perhaps I've missed it, provide um, an overview of because the question was asked of the chief about how much control council can exert on this budget and other departments having to fall into line with the direction given by council, are, have we been able to track um, the Hamilton Police Service budget, say over the last 10 years compared to say uh, the city departmental budgets? Uh, just a moment, Councillor. Oh, uh, so General sorry. Manager Zagarek was out of the room, and I did notice that. Uh, I didn't realize that. I'm back to. Prepare to answer, but uh, if you will just give a moment, or if you are willing to repeat the question. I'll try. Now that General Manager Zagarek's in the room. Thank you. Sorry, Mike, I didn't. I, my back was to you. I just wanted to know, in terms of our fiduciary responsibility in trying to understand how the Hamilton Police Service budget compares to the city departmental budgets over the last five or ten years, uh, do we have that data at our disposal comparing um, uh, the, the budgets in terms of percentage increases? So through, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, the Chief has uh, on his slide oh. the police services uh, levy relative to the city levy. Uh, if I just do a quick oh, there uh, it is. Thank you. Right. review of uh, some of the documentation. Um, over the last five years, police services probably somewhere around the 2.7, 2.8 percent, 
where uh, the overall levy has been about 2%. So just slightly above, but that would be inclusive of some enhancements as well in the case of both the levy and uh, police services budget. Thank you very much. I'm, I apologize. Um, I guess, uh, thank you. Um, I really was appreciative of your opening uh, comments about the context in which policing is having to take place these days. Um, and there's some, uh, you've referenced the, our aging population, um, the diversity, the growing diversity of our communities. Um, there were very regrettable um, statistics um, with respect to um, opioid drug impairment and mental health. And I think the challenge I'm, I'm having is, um, and I, these are, policing is a response to, um, If we could only um, budget in a preventative manner uh, for public health and, and well-being, um, and we can use traffic safety as an example, right? we're consistently having to respond to and budget for. Whereas if we um, set our value out at the at the at the forefront and designed our city accordingly. Um, it, we probably would be maybe in a healthier budget <laughs> situation. Um, so while I, I appreciate that uh, the context in which uh, the police service is having um, to police, um, I do have a regret in which uh, we're responding to it, um, having to respond to it by increasing our policing costs rather than um, perhaps the solution might be increasing some of our other city budget um, lines, which are maybe more preventative and focus. Thank you for that. If I might address that through you, Chair, uh, I definitely support that. I think our opportunity in the horizon is the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan. Quite frankly, we don't want to be in the business in certain cases, but we're 24-7. We're often the first point of contact for people in either crisis for whatever reason. It could be addictions, it could be mental health. And, you know, whether it's diversion through the courts, not to draw them into the criminal system we believe in, whether it's our youth, um, and we've been working for years on pre-charge diversion with John Howard Society, many agencies, to look at exactly what you're talking about. Um, that work is important with our Aboriginal community. It's uh, uh, one of the largest growing sectors in the demographics, we know that. So we continue to work with, and we have many agencies in Hamilton, uh, Dade Dwada Desney, Native Women's Centre, it goes on and on. Uh, it's important to establish those ongoing connections to look at exactly what you've mentioned is alternate approaches to stream it out in the first place to help kids. Again, I mentioned literacy as a big indicator in terms of propensity to be at risk later on. Let's just talk about risk for youth, whether it's gangs, high-risk travelers going over to fight for those battles, human trafficking. The fundamental risk factors are all the same. So our interventions as a <clears throat> society are so important in those early years. I know, for example, having done the research on gangs, the single most important intervention is not program, it's not all the rest. It's a single person, usually an adult, who took an interest in that person to stream them and support them. Fairly simple, but we know in some cases caretakers are not there, parents are not there, whatever happens. So whether it's sporting activities or other things, uh, the Qantas boys and all those other dimensions. I agree with you in crime prevention, as I said, <coughs> is number one on the list for core policing duties. So I agree with you where we can do that. And if I could decrease the budget, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, we see those demands increasing, particularly in mental health. We believe we have to respond in an appropriate, sensitive manner, de-escalate, obviously, we don't want the result that we've seen in other communities, and we continue to do that work, hopefully in a comprehensive manner, with our counterparts. 
Thank you. Councillor Wilson, if you can keep your microphone on. I was next on the speaker's list prior to uh, assuming the chair, and since you were the deputy mayor before me, I'm passing the chair to you Thank so you. that I can ask my questions. Um, good afternoon, Chief Gert. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions around a couple of items. One was um, in relation to Councillor Maureen's last question around uh, KPIs or performance indicators. And Chief, you had mentioned that you don't look at the correlation between number of arrests, convictions as a performance indicator. Could you just shed light on why? Um, given that my sense from residents mm -hmm. is that when they see uh, a clear number associated to arrests per crime, they have a sense of safety and security that our police services is addressing the issue that our residents are facing. So without putting too sensitive a point on it, we have the El Hesnawi uh, death as a result of homicide where the courts decided to release the accused person. When you look at the effect for public trust, and I understand that's under review by the Crown Attorney to look at an appeal, and of course I can't weigh in on that. Let's look at Bosma as a major case for public trust. Uh, those large events, everybody's watching the scrutiny. The tests in court, the decisions by courts, were we to just take a simple, and I don't mean it in a derogatory way, simple measure of arrests, you've got to look at conviction, you've got to look at the tests and standards in courts, all those things. We do provide the metrics, obviously, for traffic stops, those type of things, it's all collected. Uh, but a straight correlation between arrest doesn't necessarily mean conviction, doesn't necessarily mean, as I mentioned, with sexual assault survivors, um, some kind of uh, closure. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we believe, and I've asked that question, particularly of the Ministry of the Attorney General, why don't we have these kind of indicators between arrest, conviction, all the rest of that? They're not readily available. Uh, we do have and we do record our number of arrests by particular units. But again, if we're looking at, say, the Project Lynx case, that involved about four arrests. The scope of that investigation, which was multi-jurisdictional, and also involved Homeland Security, and the effects of that are huge. If you look at just simple arrest and conviction on assaults, the disposition is up to the courts in terms of outcome, and I realize you're not saying that, you're talking about arrests. Um, again, we don't think, and we've often heard it in other communities, you can't arrest your way out of the problem. It really does require the more comprehensive approaches, as cited by Councillor Wilson, to avoiding it in the first place, if you can. In certain cases, so let's take a drug addiction. If we can get people to the help they need, to the services they need, that's the outcome. If in fact, and we've got testimonials from people who said, I didn't really understand it until I was arrested for whatever, and that was the precipitating moment to make a change. Not that it always is. So I just think it's very complex. I don't think you're suggesting there's a one-to-one -one ratio. It just is quite complex in terms of both arrest, how we handle things, crime prevention aspects, dispositions to the court and the control that we have over it. Uh, but from the public trust piece, certainly hear that. Um, and then moving towards the uh, StatsCan report on hate crimes or hate-based biased incidences is what the StatsCan report focused on. And um, your earlier comments, Chief, about the numbers being uh, revealing in Hamilton of, our, of what um, the status is in terms of number of hate biased incidences, but that for you uh, and the, the service, and I assume via the service, the board, um, that there is a sense that those numbers are misrepresented by the way that in which Hamilton Police Services includes both hate-based crimes and hate-based activities in a roll-up of numbers that are reported to StatsCan? Correct. Um, so based on the actuals of Hamilton, um, the number of hate-based incidences, both broken down by crime and broken down by activity. Um, I know that the Police Services Board receives an annual report. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Um, and in your tracking of the activity, what are you seeing? in terms of trends. Well, and actually, you'll probably be surprised. I know that the deputy has got a preliminary figure from 2019. We've actually seen a reduction. Uh, so, I mean, there's two philosophies on it. Are we seeing less reporting because of people's sentiment on this? Are we seeing changes? And I believe the stats, and if you can pardon me just for a sec, I do have a copy of a report over here. Bit of a Luddite. 
So for example, and I do have the 2018 stats, total 125 hate bias incidents reported. This, reps, this was for 2018, represented a decrease of 8% over 2017. The breakdown was hate bias crimes five, hate bias incidents or overtones 120. The greatest number of reported incidents was directly related to racial bias. So for example, racial bias uh, consisted of 58 of those two were crimes, 56 were overtones. Sexual orientation was next at 18, not highest number, but in this list. Two hate bias crimes, 16 incidents. Religion, 49. One hate bias crime, 48 hate bias overtones. Uh, disability was zero, similar factor was zero, age was zero. And of the race categories, 41 was the black community, three were the East and Southeast Asian, seven South Asian, one white, one other race, three multiples, one Aboriginal, one Arab West Asian. The sexual orientation, 11 identified as gay, three others, uh, four identified as trans. Lastly, on the religious breakdown, and uh, hopefully there's not too much detail. Oh, I, I, I appreciate the information, sure. thank you. 30 were Jewish community, 14 Muslim, and we added that component, it wasn't historically documented, but with the Islamophobia and the rise of, we included it to track it, I believe about two years ago. Protestant, two, three, Catholic was one, and so on. This will be available because it's online, uh, the hate bias report that we produce annually. So you can go back a few years and look at it. And then deputy, if you don't mind, uh, with the current. Thank you very much, Chief, and through the chair, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that 2019 was a very difficult year for Hamilton. Not only uh, was it the perception of hate and, and the impact on our community, uh, it certainly was troubling. I, I, I applaud your leadership and, and working with uh, the police service and Sasha in trying to mitigate and manage what was take back the night. And I'm, I'm pleased to announce going into 2020, uh, we already are meeting and we're trying to get ahead of that, that angst because the impact of public safety and that feeling of safety is key. From a statistical um, approach and, and just going to what the chief has reported, these are preliminary and these, dis, uh, these will be finalized and presented in April uh, to the um, Police Services Board. But in 2018 hate bias incidents, there were 120 incidents and five criminal offenses, a total of 125. 64 consisted of mischief graffiti. We can speak about that at another time. In 2019, there was a reduction, and this was shocking to us, in fact, uh, and it was with respect to what we had gone through. But there were 84 incidents and eight criminal offenses, three additional criminal offenses, a total of 92. Again, 64 consisted of mischief graffiti. The reality is from 2018 to 2019, our numbers that presented today show a 26.4% decrease in hate incidents in the city of Hamilton. So just to draw a point to it, if I might. So in 2018 of the 125, as I said, five were hate bias crimes. Theoretically, that's what you would report to Stats Canada. 120 were racial bias incidents. So we'll read a report on that fact. Quite frankly, I think we're obfuscating a problem and misrepresenting the actual impact. So like, I'm not happy about the fact of how it's been run since, uh, but the point is, and it's not a new approach, we've been doing this for years to facilitate the reporting of. I don't really see that we should change that strategy or change the statistics just to make it, and I'll say convenient, because it's certainly not convenient, and I think it really does undercut those vic victims or survivors who are willing to come forward, particularly on racial bias incidents. Um, Chief, if I could please just hear back the number of criminal offenses related to hate-based uh, or hate-biased activity in the city from 2017 to 2019. I don't have that comp. I, oh. I don't, do you have the cumulative? Nope. Uh, broken down annually, please. 2017 number of criminal offenses, 2018 and 2019. Thank I just have the 2018, which was five. Through the chair to follow up, um, I'm not prepared, and I apologize. I do not have 2017 okay, in front of me, and, and again, that'll be presented in April. Uh, in 2018, I'll do the breakout again. Is 120 incidents of hate, but five criminal offenses. In 2019, 84 incidents. 
eight criminal code offenses. So an increase in criminal code offenses and uh, a reduction in uh, incidences as reported. I'm sorry. Yes, that is correct. And, and what was consistent year over year was 64 were um, mischief, uh, graffiti investigations. And quite frankly, that largely involves swastikas in many locations, either on a building, on the sidewalk, uh, graffiti otherwise. That's one of the big, uh, and obviously, um, the symbolic implications of using that uh, particular symbol. Appreciate that. So, um, Chief or uh, Deputy Chief, uh, whoever can answer in detail around uh, how Hamilton Police Services currently monitors hate-based organizations activity in our city. Uh, leading academic experts who came to Hamilton under the Gandhi 150 conference for the waging action against hate. There was a, uh, I forget the name of the doctor who presented uh, her research. Perry. But, sorry? Barbara Perry. Barbara Carey? Perry, I think. Perry, thank you, Dr. Perry. Uh, her research pointed out and uh, named uh, the types of organizations that promote hate-based activity and, quite frankly, are making their way to CSIS Canada's lists of organizations that are deemed as extremists uh, and also considered um, domestic terrorist organizations. And the correlation between feeder organizations to the proliferation and strength of organization for those that we find on that domestic terrorist list. So from, um, from your perspective, from Hamilton Police Services, how are we currently uh, monitoring hate-based organizations in our city? Thank you, and uh, through you both as chair and counselor. Uh, we've had a dedicated officer uh, for a number of years, as I said, it's currently uh, uh, Sergeant or Detective uh, Paul Corrigan. Um, I actually, when I was in the street crime unit in the late 90s, that was part of our responsibilities before they broke it out. Uh, so we did quite a bit of training and research on exactly, as you say, uh, hate-based uh, organizations. At that time, one of the investigations involved the Iron Cross. That's how long ago that was. Uh, but certainly, uh, hammer skins at that time were very prevalent. So we've continued to track those uh, organizations. As you know, uh, they tend to be less centralized now than they are pocketed out to smaller organizations who do their work through the internet or otherwise. Um, some distribute, in fact, uh, when I was in that unit, were distributing to high schools. So Detective uh, Corrigan tracks that. We also have, I'm trying to remember the name of the committee, HCEIT, but it's really organizations across Ontario that have hate crimes investigators that work in collaboration for the dissemination of information, particularly as you see at the higher level, I'll call it, uh, from organizations that are interested in promoting hate. And we share that information routinely. We also share it through our intelligence uh, organizations. Uh, but the repository right now, and the reason we have a dedicated investigator is that becomes a large part of uh, Detective Corgan's job to monitor not only the internet, look at the groups that are emerging, who are the key players, are they in fact based in Hamilton, have they in fact breached any of the sections for them in the criminal code, uh, what either advocate for genocide or um, are advocating hatred and the tests that are, are met there from. So, uh, we continue to have that position dedicated, we think it's important, but it's also, we involve our intelligence branch as well because sometimes they're the, uh, receiver of the information, our front line, our B-crime managers, and it is funded through Detective Corrigan for risk determinations. And is there a possibility that that kind of information could be rolled into the hate uh, crime, hate biased incident report that you, that the service puts out annually? Because the uh, sense in the community is that there is intervention that's required on an individual basis. There's intervention that's required from an educational basis. There's intervention that's required from an enforcement perspective, but there's also intervention that's required from a de-radicalization of hate activity in our city, which requires a sophisticated response that requires collaboration not only by the police services, the city, but also our community agencies and, and predominantly uh, the victims of hate-based activity to figure out how, if we do wanna take a uh, true sense of restorative justice approach, or just get a real handle on how uh, either young people may be co-opted into these movements, how uh, vulnerable residents who may be experiencing other sim 
uh, situations uh, related to income, related to mental health, who are being uh, drafted and co-opted into uh, these perceptions that then lead towards hate-based activity. I'm just curious about where our service feels we're at in terms of that sophistication uh, of response in our city. And from an intelligence-based perspective, it's probably why I flinched a bit, is if you disclose sometimes, and we may have, in fact, undercover operators in some of those organizations or online monitoring, uh, much like any other investigation, you got to look at when you disclose and how. Um, we are attentive to that. Uh, in terms of the public education piece, and I can tell you I appeared uh, a few years back with Phil Gorski, who was um, with CSIS at a Canadian context, he'd retired, and uh, mm. uh, with Cameron Batty actually, uh, as a panel discussion both on uh, high-risk travellers, to your point, uh, risk factors that enter into why would people either, and again I, I do it broadly, could be a youth gang, could be a terrorist strategy, could be a supremacy group, could be a white supremacy group, what are the risk factors that drive them to that? So you've obviously um, looked at the intervention at a public basis from education through academics and otherwise. That's one big piece. Um, we continue to do that work. Uh, we do promote, and this was hosted by John Howard Society, for example, uh, that public education piece. Uh, on the intel files, it's a little more difficult and tricky in terms of releasing that. The other problem is you have to be careful, um, and I realize at the Canadian context, they des designated some uh, new terrorist organizations, and we're certainly tracking those as well, should they appear here in Hamilton. Uh, but it really is quite fluid. It's kind of like youth gangs. Uh, they will mutate quickly through those pods, I'll call them, rename themselves, but maybe conducting the same business. So um, even disclosure to your point about what those groups are and what they're about, uh, I think has to be multifaceted, not just from a police perspective, but where we've got those arrests, we would certainly share that information when it's time to do so investigatively. I appreciate not being able to share the intel publicly. Right. I absolutely understand that from an um, outcome-based perspective in terms of what we are aiming for at the end of the day, but in terms of number of organizations present in the city. Well, and again, uh, because some of them are remote, in other words, they're doing their business through the internet, and you may have participants, but do they actually identify? It gets, and you know, I'm happy to come back uh, either to council uh, through Detective Sergeant or Detective Corrigan to kind of give that background. I know when I was in the unit, it was very difficult, very fluid. Um, you can count them much like youth gangs, but you know, uh, two months later they've renamed and they're under a different organization doing the same work. Um, certainly you can look at that in terms of a public education piece. Thank you. Um, and then finally, how is uh, our service uh, integrating assessment of um, our response to hate, or your, uh, the service's response to hate-based activity in the city? How does that occur? Yeah, and I mean from a strategy, because we know who the key victims are in terms of the time span, we reach out to those communities uh, routinely, uh, the Jewish community in particular, because they're often targeted, and we know we had that incident this year uh, with a couple of youths uh, with the swastika, had a very quick response, uh, whether it's uh, SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, uh, it, you know, again, back to the preventative piece, uh, do you have video that will cover if you think that's going to be a target? We know the implications of that. We, uh, and through our um, community relations coordinator, now Jazz, it was Sandra Wilson, uh, both Sandra and now Jazz, and Detective Corrigan always meet with the victims in these hate bias incidents and crimes because we want to provide the support, get the information. It is an important event, and we also want to know if there's collateral damage or multiple victims in this. That's one of the other strategies. So it, again, it's a combination of education, going out to the communities affected, uh, continuing and in, hopefully increasing the reporting on it, and then directly meeting with those affected by the events. And then finally, if I could to you, um, Councillor Wilson, uh, to the Chief, um, you've mentioned a couple of times on this portfolio specifically the flashpoint of the Hindu Samaj temple as being a yeah, flashpoint in our city in terms of hate-based violence and crime uh, targeted. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't heard anything related to pride in terms of not just what happened in Gage Park in my ward last year. I'm talking about what continues to occur 
for the Two-Spirit LGBTQ community uh, in Hamilton in terms of um, the events that they choose to try to organize to celebrate their identity, uh, to celebrate uh, everybody's sense of belonging in our city and what they've had to contend with from a perspective and experience of direct attack to their sense of safety and security in our city. And um, I was just curious about why that was left out. Uh, one thing, we've got the review in progress being uh, Mr. Bergman's, and that's through the direction of the board. Uh, two, we have completed the, on to, uh, the Office of the Independent Police Review Director. Uh, that report is concluded with three complainants who had service-related complaints. Uh, I suspect that will become part of the review for Mr. Bergman. Uh, the board will make decisions on uh, whether that is released or how it's released. It's not my report to do so. Uh, thirdly, we continue to meet with the Two-Spirit and LGBTQIA community. And uh, we've done two meetings. We're looking forward to further action. Uh, we continue in that context. Relative to the criminal dispositions of cases, they're still before the courts. And we'll see the outcome of that relative to the incidents down at Gage Park and further at some of the other events, both outside here and up at Mohawk College. So uh, if you're looking for why I didn't comment, many of the charges are still before the courts. We have a review in progress through Mr. Bergman, and he's doing independent consultation, which I applaud. And we look forward to what the outcome of the review is and the recommendations that might flow from it. And then finally, in the 2020 uh, budget, I know I've said finally three times. <laughs> I'm aware of that. Uh, the 2020 budget proposal that's in front of us, um, how does the community relations aspect of uh, HPS's work get um, reflected in, in what's before us from a financial perspective? Not quite sure what the question is. We do have a community relations coordinator. Mm -hmm. We have officers who interact on a daily basis uh, with a particular mindset to meet and talk to people. Uh, we have about 41 different committees that are existing now. The board asked me for that. Um, it is multifaceted. Uh, I don't see one solution. And uh, whether it's uh, doing beat crime presentations with the community or whether it's doing outreach to specific new immigrant populations or existing, uh, that work does happen through, maybe I am answering it, through our uh, community relations coordinator, but also many of those others. We don't relegate it to one particular position. It really is service-wide. Thank you. That's it for my questions. Moving on to Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Acting Deputy Mayor, I want to give all my colleagues who are not on the Police Services Board all the opportunity firsthand to ask their questions, make comments, so I'll reserve the right to come back on the list. Thank you. Partridge. Not here. Okay. Going down the list. Sorry, I'm not looking. Councillor Pauls. Thank you. Thank you, the Chair, and thank you, uh, Chief, for coming here and uh, presenting this budget. As I listen all this morning for, I guess, about two hours, I noticed that the demands on the police is increasing. And I know you've been on the force for many years, probably 30 years plus, I'm not sure. But um, what are some of the big changes you've seen through the years in policing? I think probably the biggest one, and we alluded to it, was is the consideration of quality of life and harm reduction. Considering a different strategy to, as Councillor Wilson mentioned, do crime prevention. It's not just straight enforcement. It is critical thought that leads to what can be a better outcome for the person, client, victim, survivor. These are different approaches, and I know they're encompassed in some of the legislation, but it really is a proactive move to move in that direction. Uh, you know, the days of, and I'll go back to the start of my career, giving a dated cultural reference, you know, um, Dragnet or Jack Webb, just, just the facts, ma'am, is not the case. And the complexity of issues, when you look at, and I talked about, I think, on this slide, concurrent factors. So the disentangling of not just mental health, but homelessness, addictions, poverty, all those combined. And it's not just our issue, it's everybody's issue. So if you look at, and again, if you happen to watch Police Watch, um, our social navigator, Pete Weisner, went out and showed some of the work he did with the clients for those encampments that are set up, all that type of stuff. You have to have a sensitivity to people's circumstances. It's not just a straight enforcement, this is the rules approach requires finer gradations
consideration, and I've talked about in terms of the good newsletters that I get from the public, if I'm using that as a touchstone, uh, and what I do is read them all, and there's actually dozens and dozens of them. Um, there's three major themes that, that emerge in terms of their commentary. This can be anything from a domestic to a lost cat, to a missing person, to a death notification, traffic accident, whatever. Compassion or empathy, and I do draw a distinction. Respect, professionalism. So I think what we've seen in the career of policing is growth in exactly those areas. And if you look at the training requirements, and we see them often, well, they need to be versed in this, and they need to be versed in this. That's all true. That takes time. And quite frankly, having had the experience, sometimes there's no replacement for experience, too. So it's a combination of all those things. Plus, as other ministries get out of the business of certain things, we saw it most recently uh, with the animal enforcement and the welfare of animals in general, uh, it sounded like they were just going to get out of the business. Uh, there was pushback. And I think, you know, Councillor uh, Jackson's comments, he's been watching it very closely. It's been a more methodical approach for who does what. And again, I don't really think about horses. So, I mean, I can go pet them, but I don't know really how they work. Um, so, you know, to do a proper intervention, you need that specific expertise. So it's really the growing intake of issues, the complexity of issues, complexity of response, and not to remain just enforcement-based. It really is around crime prevention or alternate methods. I appreciate that uh, answer. I know that even the police officers, they have to adapt uh, themselves and uh, they take this very seriously. When I have uh, community meetings on the mountain in my area, um, my crime managers are fabulous, you know, and uh, all the questions are directed to the police. They want the police to solve everything and uh, they do their best to do what they can. I had an incident at Lime Ridge Mall, which uh, I was involved with uh, an elderly, where so, the, some of the school kids were mocking him, and I, I went to his house, I went straight to the police to find out what's going on. I find that the police are always there, and I think we're adapting to the times, the, what we live now, and that's why the budget reflects of all the demands that you are facing. So uh, I support the budget because we want to give you all the tools for this adapting times of what we have. So uh, I appreciate uh, your answers. Thank you. And the only thing I'll add, Councillor, and I really appreciate that, is we do look, and you've seen some of the slides, cost avoidance. Can we do it differently? Could somebody else deliver the service? So it's not just a straight ask for money every time. And you'll see in my slides where we've taken that approach, try to highlight that. So even though, you know, the demands are increasing for our front line in particular, are there alternate approaches? And I mean, MSERT's a great example. You know, you do a 60% reduction of intake into the emergency rooms. We don't have eight people sitting with four cruisers at St. Joe's tying it up. And the outcome is better for the client. So to your point about our new intakes, our new recruits, we want them to apply that critical strategic thinking to, can we do it in a different way that's better for everybody? Where you get multiple wins, that's great. Sometimes it is just doing the job, though. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Collins? I defer to... Oh, uh, sorry, Councillor Partridge, then Councillor Collins. Thank you. Uh, Chief, welcome. Thanks for the presentation. Um, my, my questions are, are going to be specific to budgeted items that we've certainly dealt with in the past. Um, one of the... One of the um, issues that we've talked about has been the uh, addition of a Division 4. Yep. Um, can you just speak to the, uh, certainly the geographic size of the areas that, uh, that your officers deal with, our officers deal with, and um, the challenges that come with that, please, and how that fits into the budget? Uh, so you raised a good point, and we did put, I'll call it a place marker for Division 4 potentially. Quite frankly, in our discussions continue, is that bricks and mortar? Is there, I just mentioned it to Councillor Pauls, is there a different approach? Yep. Um, having worked out of that area, but also uh, with the building of the mountain station more towards El Frida, it raises some issues. And also, are there opportunities, and I know that uh, our CAO is looking at that, to do a joint venture either with fire or EMS? Are there efficiencies in uh, you know, economies of scale? Uh, 
MAD is a good example, our multi-agency trading academy, through federal, provincial, and you know, that was great to get those grants, get it up and running. Gave us a training area uh, where we'd had huge needs, more efficient, all those things. So we'll continue to do that piece. Uh, quite frankly, haven't landed on a final solution. Uh, the other piece, and I had, it's interesting, I just had this question from commanders yesterday, where we look at our space reallocation, you know, what's happening with that? So we gotta look at workload, we gotta look at the distribution, nature of the calls, uh, physical proximity, all those type of things. It really is a work in progress, and largely it was a place marker. Quite frankly, we're to come to this council with another $30 million ask. Uh, you're going to want a very detailed explanation as to why that would be, and why the money's not going elsewhere, and all those things. So it's a very fair question. It is a place marker. Uh, we do want to move in the investigative services building first, and to your point about the rural policing, and you know this from uh, the meeting you convened, uh, the, the number of calls is not as large as some of the core areas, both in the East End and Central. So we've got to look at allocation of spare resources, I'll call it, without being too uh, direct on that. Um, you really do have to look at strategic deployment. So it's, it's a work in progress. No, and I, and I certainly appreciate, um, you know, the officers do an excellent job uh, at the community meetings that I hold. The most recent one, uh, not as well attended as some of the others, but most of them I have, you know, 180 to 200 people that show up at, uh, at these policing meetings. Uh, and we do live in a very safe community. But when things do happen, and, and you know, I think the, the, uh, the uptick is really in break-ins, um, stolen vehicles, uh, that kind of thing. And, and I guess the one thing I want to put on your, on your horizon through you, Chair, is that we are looking to build, we will be building a new fire station in Waterdown, and, and I know that you've talked to uh, Chief <laughs> Funliff about that. Um, that is going to be you know, built in the area where the new bypass is going through. There is certainly the existing fire station on Parkside. Uh, and again, that is to serve the growing community that is out there, because it is growing exponentially. Um, so uh, that, I like that idea of leveraging partnerships, leveraging uh, budgets, and leveraging um, our buildings to be able to accommodate. And certainly the officers are located right now out at Clapson's Corners in the Innovation uh, Park building, and that works very well for them. So in terms of the shared space, have you spoken uh, yet, and, and what's the approach going to be at this point? Can you share that? Sure, and I'll turn it over, to, and I realize Dan's not here. I think he's done the bulk of the conversations, Dan Bowman, uh, but our CEO is certainly versed on where we are with that. Over to you, Anna. Yes, uh, through the chair. We, we have been working very closely with Chief Cunliffe on a number of uh, areas where we see synergies. Uh, recently, the Motorola negotiation and specific to the building uh, that you're referencing, we will be meeting the deputies and myself uh, with the chief uh, in the next week uh, to look at any potential synergies with that. Uh, we do recognize that we're serving the same public and same taxpayer, so anywhere where we can leverage a partnership um, and gain efficiencies that way, uh, we're having a lot of conversations. Uh, with. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, it, you know, the, the, the is time sensitivity, you'll have to answer that question, I guess, when you get through your meetings, but I know we are looking to build the new fire station in uh, 2021. Um, and, and to be complete shortly thereafter with full-time staff. So if there is an opportunity to, to be, uh, have police included in that structure, now is, is the time to start those, those conversations, and I'm very pleased to hear that you're doing that. Thank you. Okay, so we have Councillor Collins, Councillor Jackson, no, nope, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Collins, and uh, Mayor Eisenberger, and then Councillor Danko, you have a motion to bring to the floor. Sorry, I did it again. I just took the indicator. Councillor Jackson. Oh, well, thanks, Acting Deputy Mayor <clears throat> and uh, Chief. Uh, very good presentation, as I heard on Monday. And um, a couple of comments, and then just a couple of questions uh, to the Chief. Um, I've said, in, in spite of even what I do in the public domain, um, being, um, being on the uh, spotlight 24 7, 365 days a year. There are two professions, two jobs today that I could not do and wouldn't want to do, and that is being a teacher, and that is being a police officer, and just the dynamics of a lot of changes in society and 
and what they need to be on a multi-purpose, multi-level um, in terms of how they handle their positions in light of the demands and challenges in, in communities uh, broadly uh, today. So chief tier, t approximate 1,200, I think about 850 uniform, 350 civilian uh, commendations and uh, thanks for all they do. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, chief, how about just quickly expanding on our new community relations coordinator, uh, Jazz Dillon. Um, that acting deputy mayor, you may all recall that that position was vacant for better part of a year and the board kept uh, advocating and pressing and uh, I think there was something like 500 applications which showed tremendous interest in that position which uh, Sandra Wilson, the last community relations coordinator, uh, left after doing a stellar job. So uh, Chief, maybe just some uh, comments about um, the new uh, Jazz Dillon and the uh, new um, staffer who is occupying the community relations coordinator position, um, Ancestry from uh, India, and maybe any other comments you want to make. Through you, Acting Deputy Mayor, please, Chief. Uh, so one thing, we're extremely pleased with the selection. Uh, quite a mature person. Uh, she continues to do outreach to a whole variety of communities. Quite frankly, it's a tough job because Sandra had been in place. Uh, created many, many relationships. And as you know, in that particular position, sometimes just sitting down having a coffee and talking to people to say, here's the problem, what's the approach is, uh, we support that day to day. Uh, she has a very taxing schedule based on that. And then she has some fairly prominent issues right now as well. So very happy to have Jez on board. Uh, as I say, very mature, uh, has a very good rapport with people. Uh, quite sensitive and compassionate. We just talked about that, professional, demonstrates respect. Um, so as I say, yes, we had to wait and do two rounds. Uh, we think it was worth the wait and uh, are quite pleased to have her on board. Terrific, Chief, thank you. And I've met with her one-on-one uh, -on -one to do some sounding board ideas with each other as regarding our, um, our um, diverse uh, communities that we represent. Um, as you know, on Monday, Chief, I uh, felt the uh, four point, nearly three, four, I think, percent yep. recommendation originally was too high. And through the great efforts of uh, Councillor Collins and Mayor Eisenberger, it was lo lowered to the four percent we have here today. And uh, maybe there'll still be an opportunity to get it to the um, a rolling average that uh, was reported, the 3.8. Can I, in, in the spirit and light of that acting deputy mayor, uh, Chief, you touched on uh, and your support of photo radar. Uh, the red light camera project, of course, is entirely the municipalities. We own the cameras, and it's um, it, with the police's support, of course, 20 years ago, we were one of the first municipalities to implement a red light camera program, and it's been a tremendous success, first and foremost for safety, secondly, for the revenue it's raised uh, without, um, without impacting the levy. Photo radar, are there other municipalities in the province that you've heard of through your counterparts, that the chiefs are working with the municipality, that there might be some opportunity of uh, revenue sharing uh, in the future through you acting deputy mayor, please. Yeah, and again, I'll turn to the deputy. He's been doing the research on that, not photo radar. Uh, the automated speed, uh, I believe it's electronic or equipment device, ASE, is a possibility. But again, I would turn to Mr. Zagarek who understands uh, the restrictions in terms of what money can funnel to what. So the only one really I'm aware of is Ottawa. That's what I had heard, Chief. That right. red, red light ticket revenue, so not photo radar. Oh. Because your question was photo radar. Yes, it was. So yes, uh, but I think that's relatively new as well. Again, that's a decision for council. Okay. Um, and uh, happy to work on that piece, however that would work. Um, and again, as you know, not to repeat, but we came in the strategy with our uh, traffic officers that look, looking at fundamentally being revenue neutral from a tax levy position. So um, we certainly seize any of those opportunities. I believe it is statutorily controlled. Uh, pending anything you might have to add, Frank? Yeah, please. Deputy Bergen. Through, uh, Depu through, thanks, Chief, and through Acting Deputy Mayor to uh, Deputy Chief uh, Bergen and possibly to General Manager Zagara, because uh, my quick research told me that Ottawa may be uh, embarking upon the feasibility Right. Whether you call it automated speed enforcement, I think uh, it's dubbed in the community chief as photo radar, that type of equipment. So, Deputy Bergen, please. 
Thank you very much, Councillor, and through the Chair, uh, Deputy Diodati and I have been working on this file and we are uh, very interested in what our partners are doing in policing. Uh, there's absolutely a caveat and I think it's been alluded to. Uh, the City of Hamilton runs the program through the Public Works Transportation Operations and Maintenance, uh, but we do share a common interest and certainly with our traffic um, with regards to awareness, education, enforcement, and specifically engineering and technology. Given the recent changes to the legislation allowing the ASC cameras, uh, the automated speed enforcement, to be put in school and community zones, there is a potential increased revenue. The City of Ottawa has currently agreement with the Ottawa Police Service, wherein they receive 150000 per red light camera implementation. This money is transferred to the service regardless of the effectiveness of the camera. According to the Ottawa Police, there will be 21 cameras in the city by the end of 2021, resulting in $3,150,000 of revenues being transferred to the Ottawa Police Service. Thank you um, very much, uh, Deputy Bergen. Uh, not to the chagrin of council members in terms of for our use within the corporation of the city of Hamilton, but that sounds like at least it's uh, worth uh, pursuing that conversation uh, down the road here in Hamilton, similar to what Ottawa's doing, Acting Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Bergen. And lastly, um, Acting Deputy Mayor, my um, thanks to Lois uh, Moran as well over 20 years. I was honored 20 years ago when I, my first go around on the police board and with the late great councillor uh, Bernie Morelli that we were on the selection committee that chose Lois uh, to do the work that she's done as a police services board administrator and has done just a yeoman stellar job and wish her all the best in her retirement. Thanks, Acting Deputy Mayor. Councillor Cairns. Thanks, uh, Madam Chairman. And uh, Chief, thanks for the presentation today. My third time hearing it keeps getting better every time I hear <laughs> Sorry. it. Sorry. Thanks for that. My apologies. That's okay. Um, I want to pick up on some of the issues that Councillor Ferguson raised in terms of PTSD and uh, WSIB, and so I, I understand there's a, a bit of a, um, a budget uh, situation with that. Certainly our WSIB costs have increased. I think, um, if memory serves me right, it was just over $100,000 this year in terms of those increases. And as I understand it from speaking to our finance staff and as well as HR here at the city, um, there are additional increases probably on the horizon related to the same. So that, that chargeback system is probably only going to get worse from a financial pers perspective. And I want to say to contextualize it, and, and uh, I, I think it's important for us to have that those numbers in front of us from a budget perspective as well as, uh, as part of the annual report. And I say that in the context of when I'm a member of our finance committee here and when Laura Fontana presented our absentee uh, numbers last year, I specifically asked that we start to highlight the impacts that mental health issues and PTSD by extension have on the organization as it relates to lost time and cost. And, cost. And, and part of that is the cultural shift. I think it's healthy to get it out there in terms of the fact that people are taking advantage of it, the programs that we offer them and the assistance that they need. Uh, it's, it, part of that is reducing the stigma related to people seeking that help. And so you know, for it to be buried in our statistics and not be up on the screen prominently as you've relayed certain other key performance indicators, I think is a lost opportunity. And uh, by coincidence, next week is uh, Bell Let's Talk campaign, so we'll start to see uh, some additional efforts made when all of that um, flows through social media and, and through um, other forms as well. So uh, it's a delicate conversation to have because I, I think, uh, as, as Councillor Ferguson said, without you know naming names or sing singling people out, there's the element of abuse. There always has been as part of any of our um, programs that we have there. So I, I'm not interested in, I, I want to be careful in terms of how we, we look at that. And I think the lost time that Councillor Ferguson is trying to highlight it isn't one to criticize the fact that we have people off because as we know, the provincial legislation changed just a few short years ago. When the legislation changed then um, to permit people to go off with that claim, the numbers then are rising. And I think the same can be said, and you highlighted it here today in terms of sex, sexual assaults. We've encouraged people to come forward and uh, we're seeing the spike in the numbers, no different for mental health. I think we're starting to see some plateau with that. So I, I would like to ask um, uh, on that issue that if, if um, 
I would like to ask that it be prominently displayed in the future in terms of absenteeism as part of our budget numbers. Uh, I think Councilor Ferguson raises a, a good point. Whether someone's off on mental stress leave or they've been injured in the workplace, physically injured, um, it, there's, a, there's a cost and a toll to the organization in terms of picking up that slack. So I, I'm glad he raised it here today. To the, um, to the traffic enforcement, so you have that slide up here right now. I, I want to get to the conversation that we had at our budget subcommittee meeting and the board meeting, and then of course there are a number of questions here today. You're on the same page, certainly with, um, I think with many councillors around the table. You've highlighted the fact that this, the community by and large, whether you're on the radio and you're hearing that or you're hearing that through requests from this realm or others, um, there's an increased demand for uh, traffic enforcement in the city as it relates to aggressive driving and speeding. Not to the norm for us to start to talk about revenues um, with police budget. You've, I think, emphasized in previous years, grants. That's a form of revenue. This year we're seeing a reduction um, from the province and that, that is, <coughs> does have a, an impact on our budget in the form of, I, I believe it was just over half a million. So we don't have the opportunity traditionally to talk about revenues and, and how they play a, a, f, uh, a part in, in police, police's uh, budget. And this year's the anomaly, and it's a little unique in that, as you've highlighted here, for the four positions that you're, you're suggesting um, be created for the pilot program for traffic enforcement, there is a revenue component. And I would like to, f I would like to confirm, as I did at our board meeting, that at the worst case scenario, this is a cost neutral exercise when you factor in the revenues. And much like the Red Hill scenario, again, and you gave those metrics here today, it's actually cost beneficial. So I know that's not the reason why we're doing it. We're, we, and by extension, you and the service are responding to calls for service from the community to enforce those laws associated with the same. But could you, could you, um, advise in terms of what each officer cost as it relate, without the vehicle, cost in terms of labor, and then what you anticipate in terms of revenues that would flow through from their activity, and I think you couched it as a conservative estimate. We did. Uh, I know that Anna has those figures. I don't have the slide. I might be right here. Hang on a second. Uh, yeah, I do have it. So the cost of a fourth class constable, annual salary and benefits, is $91,063. So we would be hiring, obviously, to replace, not necessarily slotting them there because you want some experience coming into the unit. For a first-class constable, annual salary and benefits is 125761 So again, we're lowballing it, but that's okay. I'd rather come in conservative than not. Relative to the revenues that are generated, I hope I can answer because that was kind of the uh, first part of the discussion. The thing with grants is they're not, um, they're not permanent. And that's part of our problem. We've seen it with, for example, I think it was a thousand officer grant funding from the pro or from the feds, and that was for seven officers. But then they eliminated, so we have to absorb that. Uh, for the um, SCOP grant, uh, I can't remember what the acronym was. It had to do with officers on the front line, safer communities, officer, mm, whatever. Uh, again, they funded uh, for a fourth class to begin. By the time it was all said and done. It was a little under a third of the funding of the total cost of an officer. That disappeared. They actually amalgamated on the police effectiveness modernization grant. And I don't mean this again disparagingly. It was beginning to feel like this with the shells moving around. Um, and now they've renamed it again with the current government. Um, so uh, we continue to apply for those grants, try and um, provide the metrics for the particular item that they're looking for. So for example, they do fund our mobile crisis rapid response team members and our case prep unit. Because we see efficiencies through those particular areas, they fund them. But you gotta keep up with what the specific requirements are. This is, sorry, and I'll, I'll move to the other one. This is sustaining over the long term. I know when I was in traffic, for example, uh, a number of people did studies on what the revenue generation was out of, at that time, a 32-person unit. And we also had impaired driving and a few other things, collision reconstruction. So through the course of time, and again, that's anecdotal. I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but we knew that it was fundam pardon me, fundamentally a self-sustaining unit. It's one of the few areas where we can get revenue. So where we also get fees in general, there are false alarm fees. But again, our approach to the traffic office is reduce the number of calls we're going to. And we're seeing that drop, I think, uh, Deputy Bergen, by about 70% reduction in false alarm responses. 
That, that's that's conservative because in fact we've um, seen uh, closer to 75 percent reductions uh, since the implementation of the verified alarm response. And I apologize through the chair um, that we have seen uh, two days uh, on the calendar since September 1st, when in fact we went 24 hours without an actual alarm. So we have been able to sustain that. Which again then provides more time for a frontline to go do another calls for service. And it used to be about 7,000 calls for service back five, six years ago. So uh, witness fees, fairly minor. Uh, special duty revenues, we of course charge an administrative fee for the use of our vehicles, even though external people pay our officers. Police clearances, sale of accident reports, general occurrence, uh, when people ask for those. So it's fairly minor, it certainly wouldn't add up to this type of uh, cost recovery, I'll call it, or revenue neutrality. Um, so I think it's a delicate conversation, just like you said, with mental health. I think the reason photo radar failed in its first iteration was the general public felt they were entitled to speed in their vehicles that can do 280K and want to wind it out on the 400 series highways. But the other counterpart to that is the general driving population who says, these are a lot of the road rage incidents. You just endangered my life. Like I'm that upset that I'm gonna get out of a car and go over and pound you. Well, that's not a good situation. So you've got the tension between the two elements this is certainly not viewed in my view as a money grab, but we got to look at, back to trying to be uh, innovative, do we have an approach that can look at revenue neutral while still providing a core element of policing, which I think we've struck because we know the prominence of traffic safety, and I know that the councillors here, it's a lot of what you deal with as well. I hope that answers your question. It does, and I think the, you know, you've highlighted the fact, and if I use Red Hill as an example, you highlighted the, the success of that program here today. It was uh, cost neutral. In fact, it was a uh, it was a uh, revenue positive to the municipality, and that's just an ancillary benefit of the um, of the program. So the forty five percent, I think, is the one that stands out the most. That's why we supported that program. The ancillary benefit is that th those people who are driving aggressively or speeding are paying for the for the enforcement, and my constituents have embraced that and have welcomed it. And so I'm I'm uh, I'm interested then if we use this same scenario here where the enforcement pays for the enforcement, um, and we revert, revert back then to the four positions that you have proposed as part of the pilot, we haven't, as part of our budget, factored in the revenue part. And if we factor in four officers times 420, that is 480,000 in, in revenues, um, that takes us essentially down to, from a net perspective, down to the city's marker that they had on it. It wasn't a direction, it was a guess that finance comes up with um, at the start of the budget process. That gets us to the three point, around the 3.8, I think, in terms of what is currently included in the city's budget book, which again, is, is a marker. I'll turn to John for confirmation. Yes, I believe that's my, under he's nodding, yes. So is there a way for us, just as you've done with Red Hill through this pilot program, to report back after a year to say, this is when the officers were hired, these are the number of tickets, and by extension, these are the revenues, and as you've suggested, I think, uh, we'll see after a year, that this program essentially has paid for itself. Yes, uh, we certainly will set up those metrics ahead of time. We do it with many other officers doing traffic enforcement to begin with, uh, too, and I have worked. Uh, in tandem with our extremely diligent, I mentioned, Mike Segarek, uh, on that part, and we do, well, well, no, we do, and we have a very good relationship, in my view. I, I may have put it at jeopardy, but uh, he was quite conciliatory, and uh, he's going to be your first customer at the Coffee with a Cop event that you, the next one that you. Well, that's great to hear. <laughs> yes, and I did speak to Mike today, so I, I understand context. But you know, back to relationships. Mike and I have had very good relationship the course of time. I may have overstated it. I apologize for that, but uh, moving forward to your point, yes, we'd work in concert with the city, we work in concert with uh, city traffic as well. The only caution I put out relative to uh, the metrics here, this was a very specific uh, tract of real estate where you're deploying in a very uh, specific time with a specific offense. As we deploy across the city, can I draw the correlation specifically? Going to be pretty tough. Through the course of time, having been in traffic, you do a 100-year study, 
a lot of the reductions in fatalities are quite frankly a result of engineering. Better cars that have absorption and all the rest of that stuff. Which tails back to my other comment about people who want to do 280 k because I think they're going to be safe with all the features. I've been to those accidents. They're pretty messy. And uh, OPP show you the results of that. So I would recommend it. Even low-speed collisions, anything basically above 50 kilometers, you have impact. For our pedestrians, as Councillor Wilson and our pedestrians, like our pedestrians and cyclists, um, you know, they don't have all those things because they're, uh, anyway, you, you understand the impact. I get that. But I don't know that I could produce that kind of specific decrease when we deploy the metrics to your point. Yes, we can look at revenue. We can look at what's actually paid in court. All those other metrics have quite frankly been difficult to disentangle from the administrative process versus our original, what we've given people as a ticket. Right, and I think Mike's highlighted that he has. with other revenues that flow through POA as well, not Correct. police related. So. There, there certainly is an element of loss there as it relates to the JP lowering the fine or whatever happens through the court process. So I, I would, I think it's important for us to note though, you know, my colleagues want to be assured that we're doing everything to reduce the budget. You're only showing half of it, which is the expenditure side. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be lost on us that there is a revenue component Agreed. that will net a better number for us. And I, and I, I want that formally tracked. I mean, it, I, I would like to see at the end of it, just as you've done with Red Hill, I would like to see the benefit as it relates to however you can measure it, reductions and that kind of thing, but the tickets and the revenues as well, I think are important. And it highlights something in the community that we're responding to their requests. And so hopefully through this enforcement campaign, there are less calls for service in neighborhoods because we're being proactive rather than in some cases we have to be reactive. So those are my comments right now. I, I'm, um, you know, we, we certainly are above the, the average from a global perspective. I, I know there was some, um, you know, talk earlier in terms of 2% our, our increase, uh, you know, transits in tomorrow and their maintenance budget without enhancements, uh, they're in the high threes. Public Works starting this process, they're at 5.4. So uh, if there's a consistent approach to referring all those budgets back, we didn't start yesterday, unfortunately, with some of the conservation authorities that were over. If there's a consistent approach, then I'm certainly on for that. I haven't seen that in the past. I didn't see it last year. I know that in the past, police have been an easy target politically, so I, I've learned to live with that but it doesn't discount anyone from asking a lot of questions and suggesting that we, we adopt another number. So I, I understand the process as well. Those are my comments and uh, th thanks again, Chief. And I know that you have a team that works with you to present this budget and I think you highlighted it at the beginning and, and they continue to do a terrific job for the community. Thank you, appreciate that, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Second time, I think the mayor's first time, isn't he? Uh, the mayor's requested to go last. Okay. My own, uh, I, th I think uh, Councillor Collins brings up a good point about the revenue side. My only concern with that, and I know Chief, I used to talk to you about that as board chair. Since you became chief, the revenue for POAs have been falling off. And, and I saw that again, AF and A uh, gets a report from staff once a year on POA revenues and, and breaks it out by our bylaw and by police. And we've seen a downward trend and we start assuming we're gonna get this revenue, we may end up being short. So. I would throw you to Mike. Mike, uh, when we start the budget deliberations, and I don't think it's appropriate yet to send it back. I'm going to, I would like to, to see those trends on POAs from police, uh, a trend over the last five years. Am I right in my perception or am I wrong? And, and, and get a comfortable level that we're going to, in fact, see that. Um, you don't show it up there. The, the cost, the revenue per police officer is around $138,000 is what you're forecasting. You can slip. Uh, 118, sorry. You can slip to that side sure. easier. $118,000 per officer. And, and you're talking four for this year for 28. How many for 2020? Well, this is for 2028. You're going to bring in eight more. It's not spread over two years then. Correct. Eight for 2020. Eight for 2020. You have to almost, sorry if I can interrupt, you have to reach kind of critical mass to do the job between shift rotation, squad work. That you have. Oh, I'm, I'm this sorry, is actually I understood a, it was going, you're doing it in over two years, so. Nope. And, and so it's, that's $880,000 then, if we, if we put in eight. Uh, not necessarily, because we won't be starting till the levy is approved. Yeah, that's that's once it's annualized. Annualized, yes, this year, no. Correct, I get that. But I would like to see that trend. What is police doing of POAs, and is the revenue, with only my perception right now, 
sliding down over the last number of years. I know bylaws gone the other way. Um, they've, they've headed up and it'd be helpful to have that information in front of us once we start the global budget deliberation sometime in February to help us decide what we do next. That's all I have, thank you. Sorry if I might through you, Chair. I do have some answers for that. We're up 10% for 2019. That's both on uh, year-to-date hazardous moving violations, slight increase in other traffic violations. Um, also, we have seen a trend going up and down slightly, uh, but I'm gonna be deliberate in terms of my comments. When I took over from my predecessor where there was a tremendous uh, emphasis just on ride lanes and traffic tickets, what I was finding from our members is they weren't necessarily engaging in all the other traffic stops that I'd mentioned. When we talk about uh, the issue of shootings, uh, drugs, guns, money, uh, I wanted to shift the focus to a more holistic approach. Can't just be traffic and ride lanes. It has to be all these other dimensions. So, I used to argue, Chief, that you're a more kinder, gentler chief. Well, not to the bad guys, I'm not, because <laughs> if, if I've got criminals, I want them arrested as well, not just okay. general and, traffic. And that's exactly why I'd like, I'd like to see those numbers. I, clearly, I was wrong. I didn't know what 2019 was until yep. you just said well, it. I, and I'd like to see that today. in front of us before we assume we're going to get that revenue and reduce the budget accordingly. So that's all. Thanks. Okay. Sarah Eisenberger. Thank you, Chief. So I'll, I'll, I'll speak twice, I'm assuming, because uh, you know I'm, uh, you know, I, I would have concern about uh, referring this one back. I think we've had a, you know, a, a multiple time go at this, uh, and this is also my third time in the presentation. It's a fine, finely tuned presentation, and uh, getting better each and every time. And uh, I, you know, knowing and understanding that 90% uh, of the cost for policing is uh, is, is person costs. I think uh, Councillor Ferguson knows that. So. Uh, that uh, then kind of leads one to uh, if if you're going to refer something back, then there ought to be a specific recommendation as to uh, what what uh, you know, the councils would like to cut. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, we've we've had multiple goes at this. Uh, we we are you know all suffering from different kinds of budget budget pressures, and I know councils uh, you know kind of arbitrary two percent is uh, identified as a guideline, but it doesn't affect all departments in the same way. And I think that's uh, that's important to bear in mind. And you know at the end of the day. Uh, the police services board is required to ensure that uh, safety and security and policing and the, and the appropriate resources to do that are in place. And I think our board has done that. So I, I'm not going to support any uh, move to, uh, to push this back. I think, uh, you know, we just dealt with the library budget. I'm not poking at the library budget. Uh, two and a half percent, it's not two percent. Didn't refer that back. Why? Because they've, they've added things that are going to be necessary to maintain the quality of library services in our community. I think those are critically important issues. And so I want to thank the chief and, and the, uh, the police service, in fact, for all the work that's been done. Actually, the revenue issue is an interesting one. And I know that it'll be complicating because, uh, you know, if, if we build in the revenues into the police services budget, obviously you're taking it out of the city budget. So it's a net zero sum game, but it does uh, actually improve the number in terms of uh, if you build the revenues in, the, the actual number actually ends up being lower. So that's an interesting discussion to have, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the resources are required. Uh, Employee-related costs are, you know, the significant part of <laughs> Pardon me. The, the increase that we're facing today, and, and as well as the reduced uh, grants. And, uh, you know, kudos to Councillor Ferguson. It worked uh, for many years to, uh, to ensure that the... Uh, the uh, investigative services building was put in place. Uh, you know, there's costs associated with uh, you know moving in there because you know we're not going to move people in there and not provide furniture and other costs that uh, that are going to be required for them to to function and operate in there. So those costs are are coming to bear, and uh, I think that's reflected in the number that uh, that we have today, reduced from the number that we uh, we had on Monday, as a result of the work of Councillor Collins and myself to to push some things into to take some things out of reserves to cover that cost to not take on an additional staff person that uh, we can defer until another time, and uh, some, other, some other adjustments that uh, I think has gotten us to this number. So I'm not sure where else we're gonna go. Uh, what I would hate to have happen is the, the Hungarian standoff where it bounces back to the board and the board bounces it back here, and then ultimately it has to go to, Chief? OCPC. Right, I think would be, I think an unfortunate circumstance that uh, I don't think is at all necessary in this case. And so I'm, uh, I'm uh, appreciative of the budget. Uh, I hope you appreciate the work that's been done. Uh, you know, the impacts of our budgets uh, are different in different places. As Councillor Collins pointed out, uh, 
we, we are likely not to meet our own objective this year, quite frankly. Uh, if we do, I'd be, I'd be shocked and surprised. And if we do, we're going to have to make some draconian cuts in services to be able to get there. And so uh, if there's a motion to, uh, to, to push this back, then it, it ought to be in company with uh, specifically what cuts uh, the, anyone would like to make. So I won't support that, but I'll, I'll certainly support the good work that our board has done and the, uh, the chief and the service. And, uh, and, uh, and I'll certainly compliment you know, the, uh, when, you, when you see the police in action, and I've, I've had too many opportunities to do that in the uh, recent year, um, you know, their, their level of patience and training and their ability to, uh, to, uh, to de-escalate issues uh, is, is actually quite astounding. And I, I would go with Councillor uh, Jackson that uh, there's not a way in the world I would be able to maintain my patience and hearing some of the things that have been thrown at the individual police officers, not only, not only out in the community, but here in front of my office, uh, I give them uh, high marks for their well-trained, patient approach to uh, not losing their cool and maintaining uh, order in our community. So lots of great work is happening in our police services, and without the appropriate resources, uh, that, that cannot continue. So I fully support the, uh, the budget that's before you, and I'll uh, reject any notion to push this back. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Wilson, will you be speaking now, or are you interested in speaking once the motion is on the floor? Thank you. I, I know I sound like a broken, rec broken, rec broken record um, through you, Madam uh, Chair, but I, I, I can't help but um, express, while I do support photo, photo radar, um, I do support any measure uh, to enhance enforcement. It, it, it does strike me as, it certainly makes me uneasy when we start, um, we, when we start talking about um, the revenue that it, it offers us and perhaps um, our reliance on that in terms of our budget, it's, it, it seems to me that it's kind of missing the root, root problems of, um, it, it's like government's reliance on um, tobacco tax. It's kind of missing the root, root problem of, of why people are speeding, so thank you. Okay, Councillor Denko, your motion, please. This is a... Uh motion to refer back to the uh, Police Services Board moved by myself. I don't have a seconder. I can second it so it's on the seconded floor. by Councillor Nan. Um, so the motion is that the Police Services 2020 global budget be referred back to the board to request that they further review to find additional efficiencies in recognition of Council's mandate of a target 2% increase. And I'll just speak to that briefly. Um, I think the chief has done a very good job of explaining some of the very real pressures that the police service has faced, uh, that those are, um, you know, increasing in, in our modern society. And uh, I just want to reiterate this is not a statement on the great work that our police do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it's also not a criticism of the hard work that our, our board members have done, recognition that um, they've gone through several iterations of this and, and, and respect the, uh, the pressures on taxpayers. Um, but the fact is that the police service budget is one of the, the big line items that we face um, as a municipality. It's also one of the budgets that this is our only opportunity to um, have any impact on what the total budget is. We, we can't dig into the individual line items and uh, look for efficiencies ourselves. We're relying on the police services board to do that. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there are some fiduciary duties to, uh, to taxpayers and, uh, and um, again, the police services budget is a significant component to the overall uh, levy taxes that, that, our, that our residents are paying. So. Um, I'll test the will of the committee on that, and uh, those are all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pearson. To the motion, Madam motion. Chair, thank you. So to the motion, and I've been quiet listening to everything in chief. I appreciate the presentation and all the information is presented. Um, you do a stupendous job every year, and it's all of staff here. Um, I, I won't be supporting the motion. I, I believe that um, we have to have trust and confidence, not only in, in the department, in the staff in the department that do the work, but also in our colleagues that sit on the uh, board. 
and, and I have that. Um, it's, it's, I will honestly say I don't think I've ever, in all my years as a counselor, received a complaint that we're paying too much for police. I'm very honest. If anything, we don't have enough policing. And residents realize that, well, we don't have enough, but you recognize there's a cost to get more, and they know that. So I, I think we're doing the very, very best we can. Technology's made things get better, and it will get continue to get better as far as servicing that we can provide out there, using less manpower, using a little bit more technology. But to, to send this back, I think, would be um, um, very unfortunate because, I mean, we can nickel and dime, but at the end of the day, we have to provide a service. And if I had to say, do I have efficient service in Ward 10? No, I'm not going to say that because we're all, we all have our issues in all the wards throughout the whole city of Hamilton. So I will support this. I will not support the motion. I will support the budget request that's before us today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Partridge? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in, in, within the motion, I did not hear anything specific to where the mover of the motion would like to see the budget uh, changes made or cut. Um, it's a general statement to say just review to align with council's direction. Um, you know, we've heard that, that the police services board and the budget committee has uh, done that, uh, visited it, reviewed it, uh, made some changes, uh, thankfully, to you know, some of the, the direction of the, the board members. My ward um, does not have great service. I will be honest with that. No, let me rephrase that. My ward does not have the same number of police officers that uh, certainly are throughout the, the city. But I will say that the officers, when they are out there, they do a fantastic job. We cannot ask for increased service from our police without expecting to pay more money, whether it's through our taxes, whether it's through, um, uh, you know, some, some grants. And I'm very pleased to hear, by the way, Madam Chair, that there is a, a very strong effort to go after additional donations and, um, and funding out there. And I would like to, at some point, see that revenue stream because I think that's a very important part of, of the budget as well. Um, so I, I can't support any move to defer it back. I think if we're going to, and once we get into the deliberations in February, then I think we do need to take some serious looks at, as a city, what services are we delivering? Maybe we don't make any cuts, maybe we do but we definitely have to take a better look at what it is we're doing. You know, for first time counselors, maybe you haven't had the challenges come forward as much over the past year and a half um, within your wards. Certainly you've been hearing those comments. I'm not suggesting you're not, but I will tell you that over the years, it's just escalating. And the, the challenges in driving out in the rural area not just in Flamborough, but in Glanbrook and Ancaster, in all areas, Winona, um, it's a tremendous challenge for our officers to be able to get out to those areas when there is a call in an expeditious way. And their number one priority is the safety of our residents. And, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I, I'm just so grateful for the coverage that we do have and for the officers that we do have. Um, and I thank you so very much, but that's my position. I will not support the motion. Um, before I go to the next councillors, just a reminder that we are not uh, voting on the budget today, uh, that the uh, final deliberations will begin in February on the, uh, on the budget. So, Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman, and I can't support this today either. I think it's too early. All we've done on every budget presentation is simply receive it. We're not approving it. And I like to see finance staff come back to us after we've got all the presentations and, and somehow Mike and the whole, Brian and the whole finance team really help us at that time to land the plane. And uh, if, if we're gonna decide to refer it back then uh, in order to get to an end goal that we're looking for, then let's make the decision at that time. I'm worried if we decide this today and if we put the vote and it loses, and I don't know, do we need a two thirds majority to? try again and sometime in February. I know it's just a committee, it's not a council, but it'll be called into question. It'd be better if we just held off on this 
until we get everybody in, simply receive it like we've done with everything else. Um, to compare um, getting revenue to do enforcement to cigarette sales sounds bizarre to me. You, you sell cigarettes, you're making people unhealthy. You do enforcement, you're making it safer. And a huge difference. And to suggest that we're just robbing Peter to pay Paul, I don't think that applies here because this is $800,000 in revenue that nobody anticipated from staff when they put the budget together. We certainly have built in revenue from the other POAs that police and bylaw do, but not this one. This would be new. And I think it could be directed back to, to if we don't reduce the peace budget, at least reduce the overall budget, which may be the better way to do it when we try to land the plane. And, and so uh, I would hope that the mover was, would just table this for now until we have a chance to look at this, this whole global solution and then make a decision at that time. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Paul's first time. Thank you. I also will not support it, and I'm glad, you, uh, Chief, you put that up. Hamilton Police Service levy as a 0% of total city of Hamilton levy. I look at that, and uh, we it's a changing world. Policing is different. We need re resources. Uh, so I think what you presented today reflects what we're facing today. And I want to say thank you for doing this presentation. So I will not be supporting it. Councillor Tanko. Just a clarification through you to the clerk that if this uh, fails today, that it will be off the table for the final budget decision in February? You, pardon me, my voice is going through uh, acting, Madam Deputy Mayor. If this motion fails today to refer it back, this particular presentation, you can't refer it back a second time. But if you receive this today, you're not approving anything and it's more appropriately that it just be received, you can adapt, ask for additional information. And as we go through the process, the deliberations, you can receive that additional information and make your, t your decision at that time. Well, I'll take uh, Councillor Ferguson's advice that uh, we're continuing to go through the, the deliberation. There'll be more information on the, on the revenue stream and the budget in total. Um, so I'll with, uh, withdraw this motion today um, with the thought that uh, we will look for further efficiencies through all our departments um, as we finalize the budget. Thank you, Councillor Danko. Mayor Eisenberger, final speaker. Motion to uh, receive the budget and thank you to the Chief for uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you. Moved. All those in favor, show of hands. Correct? Carried. Carried. Thank you. You needed a seconder? Uh, I assume Councillor Collins will second. Thank you, Thank you so much, Chief Gert. That was a long stand for you. That's okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. And this time I didn't need a bio break, so I'm all good. <laughs> and that takes care of our presentations today. May I please have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Councillor Ferguson, second by Councillor Pearson. All those in favor? Show of hands. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>